Good morning. My name is Aurora Piñeiro, and I welcome everyone to Joyce in Latin America 2021 International Conference, jointly organized by the National Autonomous University of Mexico and the Irish Embassy in Mexico. Professor Murja and I would like to express our deep gratitude to Her Excellency Ms. Maeve von Heidnitz, Irish Ambassador to Mexico, and Dr. Sarah Kalanen, Deputy Head of Mission, for their advice and support, not only for this conference, but also for the many activities we have jointly organized with the Irish Embassy over the past three years. Joyce in Latin America is a two-day assemblage of artists, scholars, students, and readers who attempt to explore the varied ways in which Joyce's writings have informed previous and ongoing creative projects, new transoceanic conversations among contemporary artists. This gathering is indeed an invitation to expand and enrich the multidirectional exchanges occurring among the thriving cultures of Ireland and the Americas. From the first Spanish language reviews of Joyce's writings published by the Argentine Jorge Luis Borges in 1924 to the 2021 essay Zona Ciega, where the Chilean writer Lina Meruane addresses Joyce's struggle with visual impairment, the Irish author's work has undergone continuing processes of reappropriation, reception, and translation that resoundedly speak of its wide-reaching appeal and global relevance. Mario. In an essay entitled Decir Sin Decir, or Saying Without Saying, Octavio Paz actually says that the Chilean poet Vicente Huidobro, in the closing lines of his masterpiece Altasor, transcends all sense and all nonsense. Paz goes on to compare Widobro's achievement to that of Lewis Carroll, who in contrast to Widobro, and I quote, increased, increased to the fullest the plurality of meanings in words, end quote. For Paz, however, the greatest multiplier of meanings and senses is none other than James Joyce. Paz states that in Joyce, word worlds, that is, words constituting whole worlds in themselves, stand in opposition to a world made of words. To this, I would add that in specific works such as Ulysses and, of course, uh, Finnegan's Wake, Joyce's word worlds become actual multiverses. A conference like Joyce in Latin America can only attempt to explore a tiny region of those Joycean infinitudes. Our speakers on this special occasion certainly partake in such vastness, which they will illuminate there is that, um, their reflection. Welcome everyone to the Joyce in Latin todos. America 2021 International. Uh, Joyce in Latin America 2021. I have the pleasure of introducing our first keynote speaker. Tengo el placer de presentar a nuestro principal orador. James Ramey is full professor in the Humanities Department at the Metropolitan Autonomous University, Guajimalpa Campus, Juan C, in Mexico City. He heads up the master's and doctoral program, Literature and Film for the Juan C, and is the campus coordinator of the Writing Across the Curriculum program. He is chair of the research group, Expression and Representation, as well as of the International Film Studies Network, Red de Cuerpos Académicos, que investigan sobre cine, or Red Casine. He has published more than 15 referee book chapters and articles in a number of prestigious journals. His most recent co-edited volumes are Me México Imaginado, Nuevos Enfoques sobre el Cine Transnacional, and Mexican Transnational Cinema and Literature. In 2004, he received the A. Owen Eldridge Prize for an essay on Vladimir Nabokov's Pale Fire, from the American Comparative Literature Association. In 2014, he founded the Center for Writing and Argumentation of the WAMSE, the first writing center at a public university in Mexico. He is currently writing a book called Micromodernism, Parasitic Textuality and Posthumanism. He was a member of the organizing committee of Joys Without Borders, 
the 2019 North American James Joyce Symposium held in Mexico City in June 2019. Without any further ado, James Ramey. Thank you so much, Mario. Uh, thank you so much, Aurora. It's a, an honor to be here and a real pleasure. Uh, this is the culmination of a long dream uh, that we started out uh, several years ago uh, in organizing Joyce Without Borders. Um, I'm uh, really excited to be here uh, uh, with all of you. Um, let's see, I'm going to share my screen. This paper is entitled Joyce Borges and Parasitic Posthumanism. In 1982, in honor of James Joyce's 100th birthday, Jorge Luis Borges was invited by the organizers of the James Joyce Centenary Committee to give a talk in Dublin on Bloomsday. The event was the highlight of the James Joyce Symposium that has taken place in Dublin every decade since and which will celebrate the centenary of the publication of Ulysses next year in 2022. The presentation took the form of an interview of Borges by Richard Kearney and Seamus Haney, which was later published. In it, Borges at 82 is as preternaturally eloquent, memorious, and entertaining as ever. The preponderance of the interview has nothing to do with Joyce and even less to do with any influence Borges might have been willing to concede from the Irishman, but Borges does say the following. I was very struck by the way in which Joyce dared in Ulysses to write each chapter or episode in a different style. My own work also uses a plurality of styles. I'm not sure, however, that there is a direct influence here, or if there is, it is an unconscious one. I feel uneasy when talking about influences on my writing, for I do not consider myself as a writer. I don't write very good stuff, and whatever I do write, I cannot bear to reread. Nor have I ever read a commentary on my work. My library does not contain one such commentary. I have become famous, it seems to me, in spite of what I've written, not because of it. There must be some mistake, I say to myself, People perhaps mistake me for somebody else, for some other writer. These remarks are vintage Borges in that he signals his great fame as a writer, but at the same time downplays his importance by suggesting that everything he has ever written was taken from somebody else. It appears to have disquieted him that he could have unconsciously absorbed Joyce's penchant for stylistic modulation and appropriation perhaps because this would suggest an act of second order appropriation, a parasitism of another writer's predilection for parasitism. This anxiety about originality is a sentiment that Borges had voiced many times before. For example, in A Weary Man's Utopia, he writes, quote, there is nothing but quotations left for us. Our language is a system of quotations. Again and again, Borges would write or say in interviews that his art and all literary art depended on plagiarism. I seem to be always plagiarizing, imitating myself or somebody else for that matter. When asked about the distinctiveness of his work, he would often emphasize his tendency to repeat both himself and others. Quote, I'm always repeating the same old tricks. Everybody has his own trademark or someone else's for that matter since we seem to be plagiarizing all the time. When asked his opinion about the contribution of ficciones to literature, he replies, oh, I think it's made of half forgotten memories. I wonder if there is a single original line in the book. I suppose a source can be found for every line I've written, or perhaps that's what we call inventing, mixing up memories. I don't think we're capable of creation the way God created the earth, unquote. A more comprehensive confession of one's intertextual parasitism would be hard to imagine, although for Borges, it is not a confession, but a blithe description of his modus operandi. On this occasion, I wish to suggest that Borges's parasitic aesthetic of erudition, which was undoubtedly influenced by his reading of Ulysses at age 23, can be understood as a distinctly post-humanist outlook on literary dynamics because the concept of literary parasitism itself 
is of key importance to a strain of discourse that I have come to describe as parasitic posthumanism. For anyone interested, I will be diving deeper into the details of that subject at the International James Joyce Symposium next Monday, June 14th at 3 p.m. Uh, Mexico City time. To briefly summarize, several decades ago, the figure of the parasite and parasitism emerged as a major current in post-structuralism and went on to feature prominently in the recent post-humanist turn. One of the early voices of post-humanism, Michel Serre, in his 1980 magnum opus, The Parasite, makes this strong claim. The parasitic relation is, is intersubjective. It is the atomic form of our relations. Kerry Wolf, author of the 2010 What is Posthumanism, suggests that this notion from Serre, in which parasitic relations are posited as the er dynamic of social and cultural relations, is seminal to posthumanism. For Wolf, posthumanism addresses both the embodiment and the embeddedness of the human being in not just its biological, but also its technological world, unquote, as well as, quote, the decentering of the human by its imbrication in technical, medical, informatic, and economic networks, unquote. Wolf argues that our ability to confront the decentering of an embodied human being embedded in a milieu requires, quote, a change in the nature of thought itself, unquote, and that this change must come in the form of a, quote, mutational, viral, or parasitic form of thinking, unquote. The new thinking proposed by Wolf draws sustenance from his ambitious attempt to reconcile Jacques Derrida's deconstruction with Niklas Luhmann's systems theory, each understood through the prism of a posthumanism that is mutational, viral, or parasitic in relation to the centuries of humanist thinking that preceded it. It is therefore of substantial interest that in, that in 1983, just three years after the publication of Serres' The Parasite, Borges publishes Shakespeare's Memory, his last major short story. This narrative, on a par with the best of his ficciones, radically recasts the notion of literary parasitism that he had begun to explore in earnest in his 1938 Pierre Menard, author of the Quixote. Underscoring his decades long preoccupation with the parasite theme. The setting of the story is that of an academic Shakespeare conference in Europe, where the attending scholars wear name tags as they discuss their celebrated author and is thus conspicuously reminiscent of the Joyce Symposium Borges had attended just a year before the story was published. However, since Shakespeare's memory is much less well known than Borges's earlier work, I will summarize it here. The story is written in the first person by a German Shakespeare scholar named Hermann Sorgel. The premise is that the entirety of Shakespeare's remembrances, described as, quote, a dead man's magical memory, unquote, has been kept alive, passed down through the centuries from one human carrier to another. At the conference, a scholar by the name of Daniel Thorpe surprises Sorgel by offering him Shakespeare's memory, quote Shakespeare's memory, from his youngest boyhood days to early April 1616. The premise of this offer evokes an offshoot of posthumanism known as transhumanism, theorized by Catherine Hales and others which explores the notion of mind uploading in which technology is used to create a backup of human consciousness that will lead to machine-based immortality. Sorgel, however, not to be trifled with, interrogates Thorpe about the specifics of receiving such a backup, sensing the implicit possibility of self erasure in becoming the vessel of another man's memory. But Thorpe replies, quote, what I possess are still two memories, my own personal memory and the memory of that Shakespeare that I partially am, or rather two memories possess me. Sorgel thinks briefly, quote, had I not spent a lifetime colorless yet strange in pursuit of Shakespeare, was it not fair that, that at the end of my labors I find him, unquote. He accepts the offer and then proceeds to narrate the years long process of the manifestation uh, in, in his mind of Shakespeare's memory. He considers the possibility of writing a Shakespeare biography, but rejects the idea because, quote, 
that literary genre requires a talent for writing that I do not possess, unquote. Toward the end of the story, Sorgel sums up the experience thus, quote, throughout the first stage of this adventure, I felt the joy of being Shakespeare, throughout the last terror and oppression. At first, the waters of the two memories did not mix. In time, the great torrent of Shakespeare thre threatened to flood my own modest stream, unquote. Ultimately, Sorgel dials a random telephone number and offers the memory to the next carrier who unquestioningly uh, accepts it. Sorgel writes, quote, paradoxically, I felt both a nostalgia for the book I should have written and now never would, and a fear that the guest, the specter, would never abandon me. It's huesped y espectro in Spanish. Thus, the parasitic guest or specter leaves its host tired and dry. Sorgel wishes for nothing so much as to erase the bard of Avon's memories that he had once enjoyed. It is not an accident that Sorgel in German is a nickname for a sorrowful person. Published some 45 years after Pierre Menard, this tale recapitulates the earlier story's general lampoon of an academic's worshipful attitude towards his subject. But the central synecdoche of this story is different from Pierre, Medard, Pierre Menard's. Rather than observing that classic texts are enriched by the generations of readers who interact with them, by positing Shakespeare's memory as a parasite on Sorgel, a foreign entity that possesses him, Borges suggests that all writers are parasitic on all readers, including Shakespeare on Borges and Borges on us. The parasitic or viral logic of this notion is posthumanist in terms that Serre, Derrida, Luhmann, and Wolff would appreciate. But this is not the first time Borges has expressed such an awareness. Indeed, this story recalls concepts that have preoccupied Borges since the very beginning of his writing career. For example, in a 1927 essay on literary pleasure, Borges argues that the passage of time can actually improve the pleasure that famous texts give us, saying in regard to a passage from the Quixote that, uh, me. time Cervantes's friend has sagely revised his drafts. But Borges contrasts this improvement of texts over time with what happens to the authors of those texts. Hmm, I seem to be on the wrong slide, sorry. There we are. Um, immortals have generally another destiny. The details of their feelings or thoughts tend to vanish or lie invisibly in their work, irretrievable and unsuspected. In contrast, their, individu their individuality, that simplified platonic idea, which they never purely possessed, fastens upon souls like a root. They become as impoverished and perfect as a cipher. They become abstractions. They are barely a bit of shadow, but they are so eternally. So Borges is extremely preoccupied with immortality, even at the age of 28, uh, and he will be so uh, throughout his career. Thus, Borges distinguishes between the evanescent feelings or thoughts of a given author, which die with the body or linger invisibly in the work, and the author's individuality or identity as it persists over time in the consciousness of readers, where it fastens on souls like a root. Since Shakespeare's biography has traditionally been a subject of intense speculation, famously parodied by Joyce in Scylla and Charybdis, um, which Borges had already read, uh, with Shakespeare's memory, Borges takes the quintessential example of an author whose feelings or thoughts have vanished or lie invisibly in his work and reverses the equation postulated in his 1927 essay. Now it is the author's memory, the feelings and thoughts that he experienced in life that parasitically fastens upon souls like a root rather than merely the simplified platonic idea of the author, barely a bit of shadow that ordinarily is the only immortality a writer can attain according to Borges. One significant antinomy set up in the essay uh, in the 1927 essay, is the idea that the author's, quote, details of thought, of feelings or thoughts represent a transitory finite self 
or absence of presence, as Derrida might put it, that lives after death only in the abstract form of a simplified platonic idea in the minds of other people, a hauntology or parasitic supplement capable of immortal proliferation through texts and times. This abstraction does not correspond to the original Aristotelian details of the author's memory and thus becomes impoverished and perfect as a cipher. The conceptual touchstone of Shakespeare's memory is precisely the reversal of this Aristotelian platonic antinomy. Rather than the literary work itself becoming immortal or a simplified platonic idea of the writer becoming immortal, the writer's subjective memory becomes immortal with all of its Aristotelian details and nuances. Derrida's critique of the, of the Western metaphysics of presence then can be understood to be personified by the effaced trace of Shakespeare's ghostly memory as thematized in this story. It, it bears mentioning therefore that another important precursor of the story can be seen in a later Borges essay that meditates on Western metaphysics by describing Aristotle and Plato themselves as transhistorical parasitic entities, not unlike the guest or specter in Shakespeare's memory. In his 1949 essay, From Allegories to Novels, Borges cites Coleridge's observation that, quote, all men are born Aristotelians or Platonists, unquote. He then articulates a philosophical phenomenon that he sees as a centuries long struggle between two immortal antagonists. The Platonists sense in, this is a quote from the essay, the Platonists sense intuitively that ideas are realities, the Aristotelians that they are generalizations. For the former, language is nothing but a system of arbitrary symbols. For the latter, it is the map of the universe. The Platonist knows that the universe is in some ways a cosmos, an order. This order for the Aristotelians may be an error or fiction resulting from our partial understanding. Across latitudes and epochs, the two immortal antagonists change languages and names. One is Parmenides, Plato, Spinoza, Kant, Francis Bradley. The other, Heraclitus, Aristotle, Locke, Hume, William James. In the arduous schools of the Middle Ages, everyone invokes Aristotle, master of human reason, but the nominalists are Aristotle. The realists, Plato. The two hypotheses correspond in all likelihood to two ways of intuiting reality. Nominalism, once the novelty of a few, today encompasses everyone. Its victory is so vast and fundamental that its name is useless. This is not the first time Borges has taken on this subject. In his 1936, A History of Eternity, he suggests that Platonic realism, quote, yearns with a strange love for the still and distant archetypes of all creatures, unquote, but is based on, quote, a doctrine so distant from our essential nature that I disbelieve all interpretations of it, including my own, unquote. In this earlier essay too, he concludes that, quote, now we do nominalism sans le savoir, as if it were a general premise of our thought, an acquired axiom, unquote. But if there is a single outstanding difference between the 1936 essay and the 1949 essay, it is that in the later one, Borges for the first time personifies the two philosophies as transhistorical beings or agents. To be sure, in the limited context of Borges's essay, this personification may be read as nothing more than a literary device. But seen in the larger tableau of Borges's work, this metaphor of two immortal antagonists reiterating in philosopher after philosopher, latitude after latitude, epoch after epoch, is strikingly congruent with his later notion of Shakespeare's memory as a variety of parasitic guest or specter that uh, possesses people sequentially over several centuries. And this conceit also happens to recall J. Hillis Miller's deconstructive musings in 1977 in response to Derrida in a, an essay called Critic as Host. Quote, could it be that metaphysics, the obvious or univocal meaning 
is the parasitical virus which has for millennia been passed from generation to generation in Western culture, in its languages and in the privileged texts of those languages, unquote. This suggests that by 1949, long before deconstruction, Borges had already begun to conceive of the Aristotelian and Platonic philosophies, read the immortal antagonists of Western metaphysics, as being parasitic on people presumably finding more hospitable hosts in those who are born with uh, one or the other of the two ways of, int of intuiting reality. However, Borges also argues that in our own era, one of the immortal antagonists, Aristotelian nominalism, has had, quote, a victory so vast and fundamental that its name is useless. This bears the implication that contrary to Coleridge's view, being born with one of the two ways of intuiting reality is not a sufficient criterion for one to end up a Platonist or an Aristotelian. This in turn suggests that the parasitic proliferation of ideas and modes of thought through society, hyperbolized by Shakespeare's memory in Sorgel's mind, can become such a great torrent that it can overcome any innate leanings and thereby leave most individuals with the dominant viewpoint of their eras, which in the Middle Ages, according to Borges, was platonic, whence the ascendancy of allegory, and which in modernity is Aristotelian, whence the ascendancy of the novel. Borges's own platonic tendencies, it should be observed, cause him to Platonize both Platonism and Aristotelianism as eternal archetypes of thought, archetypes which he personifies as immortal antagonists. However, he nevertheless historicizes the, the personification by suggesting that like a parasitic plague, these doctrines can proliferate through societies and through eras. And this is not dissimilar to the parasitic concept of quote, the plague of Catholicism, unquote, that Joyce excoriates in Stephen Hero, uh, in which he describes priests spreading over Europe in the form of, quote, black tyrannous lice, unquote, a notion Joyce develops in various other ways throughout his oeuvre, as I have shown elsewhere. In Shakespeare's memory, the magical memory of a dead man passing from host to host and era to era can be understood as a synecdoche of this historicizing aspect of Borges's vision. Like Pierre Menard, this story is meant to use realistic details to suggest universalizing holes about the relation of literary immortality to consciousness conceived in textual terms. It is no accident that the name of the man who bestows the magical memory on Sorgel is Daniel Thorpe, since Thomas Thorpe is the famous publisher of Shakespeare's sonnets. Borges thereby suggests a metaphoric relationship between Daniel Thorpe's mind in the 20th century, which preserves like a text Shakespeare's magical memory, and the book of sonnets printed by Thomas Thorpe in the 17th century, which among all the works of Shakespeare is presumably the one most overtly related to the intimate thoughts or feelings of the author. This parallel suggests Borges saw Shakespeare's sonnets as a literary version of transhumanist mind upload, that Shakespeare succeeded to some degree in encoding an embodied version of his original cognition in those verses. Moreover, the symmetrical dichotomy between uh, 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 excuse me. Moreover, the symmetrical dichotomy between the intangible mind of Daniel Thorpe and the material book of Thomas Thorpe, two different media for memory, uh, for memory inscription, recalls Borges's observation in his essay on the cult of books that Plato distrusted writing because, quote, a teacher selects a pupil, but a book does not select its readers, unquote. In the Phaedrus, Borges tells us, Plato recounts, quote, an Egyptian fable against writing, the practice of which causes people to neglect the exercise of memory and to depend on symbols, and said that books are like painted figures that seem to be alive, but do not answer a word to the questions they are asked. To alleviate or eliminate that difficulty, he invented the philosophical dialogue, unquote. Borges seems to address precisely this ancient problem in Shakespeare's memory since Daniel Thorpe, presumably guided by his parasitic guest, 
is able to enter into a lengthy late night dialogue with Sorgel before selecting him as the next host in a way that Shakespeare would never have been able to select readers for the book of sonnets published by Thomas Thorpe. Indeed, in the context of a story about Shakespeare scholars, it seems inevitable to conclude that Borges is alluding to the publication of that book precisely because Thomas Thorpe was famously thought to have published the sonnets without Shakespeare's consent, to have, in a word, parasitized them. We may surmise that Shakespeare's memory has not forgotten this little contretemps and has therefore parasitized someone who may be a lineal descendant of Thorpe. Tit for tat, parasitism for parasitism. This might explain Sorgel's first impression of Thorpe, quote, when a man reaches a certain age, there are many things he can feign. Happiness is not one of them. Daniel Thorpe gave off an almost physical air of melancholy, unquote. This coming from a character whose very name means sadness. But the published version of the sonnets, their physical form, also gives off an air of melancholy when one reads them. So the allusion to Thomas Thorpe may also function metonymically, underscoring the parallel relationship between physical texts and human memory that Sorgel mentions later in the story. Quote, De Quincey says that our brain is a palimpsest. Every new text covers the previous one and is in turn covered by the text that follows, unquote. This Daniel Thorpe, Thomas Thorpe parallelism fits neatly into the pattern of the story's governing, governing synecdoche, since it enfolds the layering of all texts into all brains by all readers, including Borges and including us. Moreover, the parasite that is Shakespeare's memory in the story is a Borgesian paradox as well. It seems like a falsehood, a fantasy, but it literalizes a truth, which is that all writers are parasitic on all readers, including Shakespeare on Borges, Borges on us, and yes, me on you. This is one of the more uncomfortable insights of parasitic posthumanism. We are all constantly parasitizing each other by sharing our words and thoughts with each other, seeking new hosts for our ideas and memories, reproducing our bits in other people's brains. With this notion, however, Borges does not mean to imply that he or Shakespeare is any more alive in us than the characters or worlds they create. In another context, Borges paraphrases Robert Louis Stevenson's observation that, quote, a book's characters are only strings of words. Blasphemous as this may sound to us, Achilles and Pier Gint, Robinson Crusoe and Don Quixote may be reduced to it. The powerful men who ruled the earth as well. Alexander is only a string of words. Attila, another, unquote. As we have seen, Borges feels that the same may be said of the author of any famous work who only fastens upon souls like a root, becomes as impoverished and perfect as a cipher or barely a bit of shadow in the memories of others. As he put it in the 1921 inscription on any tomb, one of his earliest poems, quote, blindly the uncertain soul asks to continue when it is the lives of others that will make that happen, as you yourself are the mirror and image of those who did not live as long as you, and others will be and are your immortality on earth." Unquote. Indeed, the survival of Thomas Thorpe's immortality on earth as a widespread cultural referent is reminiscent of another of Borges's stories of academic antagonisms, the 1970 Guayaquil in which one scholar points out to his rival the parasitic relationship between fa famous texts and those whose names are connected to them. Quote, the name of the person who presents the letter to the world will always remain linked to the letter, unquote. The invocation of Thorpe in Shakespeare's memory, therefore, reminds us that his name is only known by so many readers because he is parasitically linked to the letter, linked forever, in fact, to his purported act of parasitism, a crime for which he lives in ignominy, but to which we also owe our possession of Shakespeare's incomparable love poetry, or rather its possession of us, as the story's central synecdoche makes clear. 
With these observations, I have tried to give a sense of how a substrain of posthumanism that focuses on the figure of the parasite and parasitism can be used productively to examine the dynamics of literary texts and to perceive the axis of relationships between literary authors who manifest an awareness of these dynamics. The boundless appetite for allusion and erudition evident in the major works of Borges and Joyce suggests that what they most have in common is a penchant for parasitism, a guilty passion that both troubled them and inspired them by guiding their creative processes at a fundamental level. I will end today with a revelation that Borges makes at the close of his interview at the Joyce Symposium, discussing the problem of blindness that he did share with Joyce. Sometimes I treat myself to a little deceit surrounding myself with all sorts of books, particularly dictionaries, English, Spanish, German, Italian, Icelandic. They become like living beings for me, whispering to me in the dark, unquote. The notion of languages as a species of living systems that are parasitic on humanity is another concept that has been developed in posthumanism and is thus another adumbration by Borges of the posthumanist turn. It would not be surprising if the little deceit Borges mentions included uh, Ulysses or Finnegan's wake among the living beings he invited to whisper to him in the dark. But a discussion of that potential mind upload will have to await another felicitous occasion. Thank you very much for listening and enjoy the conference. <laughs> Thank you very much, Professor Ramey, for such an enlightening uh, talk. Uh, I think we have a, a couple of minutes for a few questions, if you don't mind, for, for a quick Q&A. Of course. Um, I'm trying to stop sharing. <laughs> and you have successfully done so. OK, good. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, we, we have a question here. Perhaps okay. you would like to, to Give it a try. Uh, it says, um, in number 77 of Sur magazine, Borges wrote that Joyce's writings are more intense than Goethe's and more delicate than Quevedo's. Uh, in what sense can we observe this in Ulysses? Um, uh, Borges uh, makes the observation about uh, Joyce as an intense writer on more than one occasion. Um, in the interview that he gives uh, at, at the uh, 1982 Joyce Symposium, uh, he, uh, he says, uh, one of the things I didn't have time to, to uh, discuss in, in this talk uh, is, is that for him, Joyce, th there are some writers, there are some novelists who are novelists uh, of the representation of reality. And there are other novelists who are um, enamored of words primarily words. And he uh, locates Joyce in the second category. That um, although uh, uh, Stephen, he mentions uh, Stephen, Bloom and Molly uh, are, are wonderful characters, uh, Joyce's primary preoccupation is uh, that of a poet, playing with words like playthings. Uh, and, and, and Borges later in, in, the, uh, in the interview uh, say, uh, says that, um, before he went blind, he was able to play with words like play things too, but, um, but that uh, blind people don't enjoy playing with toys, which is kind of sad. Um, but uh, I think that, that when Borges describes the intensity uh, of Joyce, he's describing the intensity of reading this series of words that each one of which, as, as Mario uh, brilliantly uh, uh, quoted from Paz, uh, is a world unto itself uh, in many cases. Uh, and so that is, is a form of intensity that I think Borges admired in Joyce and, and tried to imitate in him as well. He, 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 he was fascinated by Joyce's ability to play with the infinite resonances and um, different possible connotations of words in context uh, and, and to create new words. Um, and, and I think that that, that is, uh, I, I would say it, it's, it's the mixing of styles and um, the, uh, it's not just the number of fancy words uh, on any given page, but also 
uh, the, uh, the density of the ideas and especially the allusions and references to other literary works. Um, there, there are more allusions in Ulysses per square word uh, than practically in any book that had been written before it. Uh, and that is something that Borges um, seems to have taken from Joyce. In fact, the, I, I've, I've written elsewhere about how Joyce's aesthetic of erudition was something that Borges uh, was inspired by. And I think that it, um, if we can talk about intensity as the, a, a certain frequency or conceptual density uh, of allusions, um, uh, inventive use of words and language. Um, that's something that I think Borges is talking about when he re uh, refers to uh, intensity. He, he, he also thought that, that Joyce was, was an incompetent um, uh, 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 creator of plots. He didn't think that, that Joyce was any good at, at that aspect of, of writing novels. He thought that, that um, uh, Joyce had other gifts, but, but that creating structures was not one of them. Thank you very much. Um, we have another question here. Um, what, what is your opinion about the relationship between author and reader? Can parasitic texts only exist if the reader detects the reference? Oh. Um, from the point of view of the, of the textual system that is being reproduced when we read, uh, it, it, it doesn't care. It, it just, it, it, it's, uh, uh, its purpose, if you want to, if we want to attribute a, a, a human characteristic to it, uh, is to reproduce. And so it doesn't care in that sense, in that metaphorical sense, whether you know where it came from or not. It just wants to proliferate and, and uh, uh, spread through as many minds and texts as it can. Um, for, for us on the receiving end, it, it's, it's a matter of taste. Do you care where, where you're getting your ideas and, and where the, the things that, that come to form who you are, uh, do you care where they come from uh, or not? Um, that's, that's a, it, it, it's a, it's a stylistic decision that we each have to make in life. Right. Thank you. Um, another question here, uh, given that we are all composed of the languages we acquire through listening, reading, speech, do you feel that the search for originality, the new for originality or the new is quixotic, impossible? And how can we indeed say with any authority that so-and-so is an original and you a different voice? Um, this may be apocryphal, but when I was uh, at Vassar College, my, uh, one of my, uh, my, my dissertation, my, 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 my thesis advisor, Paul Russell, uh, quoted from a commentary on the Book of the Dead um, by an Egyptian writer uh, in the 17th dynasty, uh, lamenting that everything had already been written and there was no point in going on with, with writing because it was all going to be derivative. And so I think that if, if, if that, uh, that quotation uh, can, can be attributed to something real, uh, it, it's always stood for me as, as a, an example of how tiny we are in the face of the infinite. And the infinite is, is one of the main themes that Borges is preoccupied with throughout his career. Um, and so Borges was extremely aware of the paradox that although we're constantly parasitizing each other, we're constantly uh, in, in what he called a living labyrinth uh, of, of words and illusions, um, it's also impossible to exhaust it. It's, uh, it. It would be presumptuous to think that in the tiny amount of time that humanity has had, that we've come anywhere close to exhausting the library of Babel. Uh, there are plenty more books to be written. That's what I would say. Thank you. And uh, I, th I think we have enough time for a couple of more questions, if you don't mind. 
Um, sure. Uh, we've got one here. Uh, what you call uh, parasitism constitutes René Girard's mimetic theory framework and has been used for the analysis of literary theory. The best poets are immensely aware of their imitations. Parasitism has been held to be a common device of modernism. How would literary criticism profit from noticing that such a strategy, which Eliot, Joyce, or Borges employ, is already at work in Shakespeare and the rest of the classics? So it's a, that's a very good question. Um, and uh, uh, it, it's true that in a lot of uh, French theory, um, the, the, the notion of parasitism is, is being looked at and has been looked at for a long time. Uh, Derrida um, explicitly describes himself as a parasitologist um, in, in a 1994 uh, interview. And so uh, the, the notion of, for, for Derrida, the question is uh, whether uh, written language is, should, uh, should w whether it's correct to see written language as being parasitic on spoken language. Uh, or um, whether that notion of secondariness or supplementality uh, should actually be reversed uh, or, or interchangeable. Um, so so the, the, the notion of, of parasitism and, and the parasite um, has been around for quite a while now. Uh, however, Joyce, Borges, Nabokov, and, and others uh, have been uh, thematizing the parasite in their works uh, for a long time. Uh, and in fact, yes, uh, Shakespeare does as well. There, there's at least one uh, quotation uh, from Timon of Athens uh, that, that, that uh, makes, one, makes one think that he's aware that, that his use of other uh, of, of previous authors is uh, similar to the work of uh, parasitic insects. Um, so it's, it's an idea that's been around for a long time, and its, it's, it's moment is now in many ways because of the post-humanist turn that is, is taking place in uh, many fields of the humanities, um, where um, uh, especially the, uh, the human's place in the embedded nested systems that we have evolved in is being decentered. Um, where uh, the, the relationship of uh, human consciousness and, and human biology to other living systems, including language systems, is being questioned and reframed. Uh, the notion that, that languages which evolve over time, we, we can, uh, ling linguists spend their entire careers uh, examining how uh, languages evolve over time those can be seen as uh, semi-living systems the way a virus is a semi-living system. It's not, it's not autopoetic, but rather um, it lives a borrowed life by interacting with uh, autopoetic systems like ours. Um, so so I, I, I'm excited about uh, the, uh, theorizing uh, parasitism in the context uh, of post-humanism. The, the two things are, are dovetailing really well. Thank you very much. I think that's all the time we've got for now. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Jamie, for this uh, exciting talk. And uh, I think um, we need to take a break now, a five minute break. And we will be back at uh, 10.55 sharp for a very important ceremony. Okay, Mario, thank you so much. Thank you, Aurora, and thanks to all. This is really fun. Thank really, you, James. Really that it. was that was a wonderful lecture. Thank you very much and, and, and stay connected, please. I will. Good morning to everyone in the audience and to our distinguished guests. Welcome to the announcement ceremony of the, of the Evan Boland and Enright Irish Studies Chair at the National Autonomous University of Mexico. It is a privilege for me to announce this chair, which will focus on consolidating and promoting academic and cultural exchanges between Ireland and Mexico. Featuring poet Evan Boland and novelist Anne Enright as emblematic cultural figures, the chair will foster conversations, scholarly discussions, and critical analysis on the study, promotion, and dissemination of Ireland's outstanding contributions to both literature and art. 
UNAM's School of Philosophy and Literature and the Embassy of Ireland in Mexico will be the main institutions to foster and encourage the chair's endeavors. The Evan Boland and Enright Irish Studies Chair is indebted to the Evan Boland State as well as to author Anne Enright for accepting to partake in this project. I would like to say that we are very, very grateful to all the authorities, the UNAM authorities who are here today with us. Uh, thank you to our guests. And uh, I, I need to say that I am honored to, to present uh, Her Excellency, uh, Ms. May von Heinitz, the Ambassador of Ireland to Mexico. Um, Her Excellency, please. Good morning and, and thank you very much Aura and Mario for the kind introduction. Um, as Mario said, my name is Maeve von Heinitz. I'm the newly arrived Irish ambassador here in Mexico. I was thinking last night um, about what I should say this morning and, and going through all the papers that my colleagues had given me. And I realized with alarm that the first lecture was entitled Joyce Burgess and Parasitic Posthumanism. And to be frank, I think it's incredibly unfair to ask anybody, especially a civil servant, to cop a title like that and to come after it. Um, but I hope after a coffee break, you've um, been able to recover and are prepared for something a little bit more mundane. Um, I arrived in Mexico just under a month ago. And on my first day here, my family and I took a car and we went to Polanco and we decided to walk around the famous Lincoln Park that we'd heard so much about. And we were walking through the park and walking in and out of the little streets around it. And I suddenly looked up and realized that I was standing on Oscar Wilde Street. And I thought there couldn't be a more wonderful omen to start a posting in Mexico than to find myself in literally the first hours standing on, on such an Irish literary street. So less than a month later, it's, it's really a, a great honor for me to be able to be here with you all this morning and participate in this ceremony to mark the new Evan Boland and Enright Irish Studies Chair. Today and tomorrow at the seminar, we'll celebrate Gems Joyce. We'll celebrate the contributions of Evan Boland and Enright, and Anne Enright, and we'll celebrate the broader sweep of Irish literature. I would like to express our, our really sincere thanks at the outset to UNAM, and particularly for those joining me on the panel this morning, Dr. Jose Francisco Trigo Tavera, Vice Provost for International Affairs, Dr. Mary Frances Rodriguez van Gort, Dean of the School of Philosophy and Literature, and Dr. Nair Anaya Ferreira, Academic Secretary of the School of Philosophy and Literature. I, however, at the outset, particularly also want to acknowledge the tireless work and the really sincere commitment of Professor Aurora Pinero and Professor Mario Murguia. Quite simply, we are only here today because of their ambition and their vision their hard work and their love of Irish literature. If you'll allow me, I also want to acknowledge the work of my colleagues in the embassy, particularly my deputy, Sarah Callanan, for all of the efforts they have put into making um, today and making the chair happen. This chair is really particularly special to us. It's the first Irish studies chair in Mexico, and we are honored and delighted to have it um, established in such a prestigious um, and well-known university. I hope really that this chair is going to mark the start of a real and new flourishing of Irish studies across Mexico. Now, I think genuinely that for Irish people, our literature is at the heart of how we communicate with the world. It's how we tell our story, the good and the bad, all of its different guises. It's how we try to share a little bit of our soul. And we are really deeply fortunate as a country to have so many gifted writers, both past and present. I want to acknowledge Mary Costello, who is one of the Irish writers joining us this morning. I've come to Mexico from Germany. Um, the last major event I did and spoke at in Berlin um, was a festival of Irish female writers in February where Mary was the headliner. So for me personally, it's a wonderful coincidence that she's participating this morning and a good omen for the time ahead. Of course, I also want to particularly acknowledge and thank both Anne, Ren Anne, Wright, Anne Enright herself Anne Van Boland's family for joining us here this morning. Anne Enright, as you all know, is one of Ireland's most accomplished writers. Her novels and short stories, as well as her nonfiction, have been internationally recognized and enjoyed both in their original and in translation around the world. 
Her latest novel, Actress, is a really wonderful read and adds very significantly to her impressive body of work. Avan Boland, who sadly passed away a little over a year ago, is one of Ireland's best known and most loved poets. She is also a poet which, rightly or wrongly, Irish diplomats like to try to claim for ourselves. This is due to her close connection with our diplomatic service through her father, the distinguished Irish ambassador, Frederick Boland. In 2018, Evan Boland was commissioned by the Irish UN mission in New York, together with the Royal Irish Academy, to write a poem to mark the centenary of the first extension of the vote to some, of some women over 30 in Ireland. She read that poem, Our Future Will Become the Past of Other Women, at a special ceremony at the United Nations in New York in, at the end of 2018. And it's a poem which when I was reflecting on today, on today last night, I came back to. I think it's a really fitting poem for this morning because Ireland and Mexico as countries have such a long history of multilateral cooperation in the UN and in other international bodies. And right now we're serving together again on the UN Security Council. Very importantly, on that council, we're currently, um, as two countries, co-chairing the work of the Council on Women, Peace and Security, issues which go really to the heart of the poem. And just in terms of timing, Mexico is, of course, after holding its largest election in history on Sunday, and I understand has elected a record number of female state governors. At its heart, however, the poem really highlights how values can be shared across countries and across peoples, even on opposite sides of the world. And the poem shows how literature can act as a bridge in so many different ways. So as we look forward to the continued strengthening of our relationship with UNAM and to bringing Irish studies to students in this institution and hopefully also across Mexico, I hope you might indulge me in reading just a little bit of the final section of the poem. So this is the, the final bit of um, Ivan Boland's poem, Our Future Will Become the Past of Other Women. Our island that was once settled and removed on the edge of Europe is now a bridge to the world. And so we share this day with women everywhere. For those who find the rights they need to be hard won, not guaranteed, not easily given. For each one, we have a gift, a talisman, the memory of these Irish women who struggled and prevailed, for whose sake we choose these things from their date, to honor, to remember, and to celebrate. All those who called for it, the vote for women, all those who had the fate that voices can be raised, can be heard, all those who saw their hopes become the law, all those who woke in a new state, flowering from an old nation, and found justice no longer blind, inequity set aside, and freedom redefined. Thank you very much. Thank you, Your Excellency, and thank you again for all the enthusiasm and the hard work. Um, and especially, uh, I would like to say thank you to your team at the Embassy, especially Sarah Kellinen. They have all been marvelous, and uh, we expect to be working with them uh, in the future. Uh, we, are, we are all very excited to have you here. Thank you very much. Um, I now would like to present uh, Dr. Jose, Jose Francisco Trigo Tavera, Vice Provost for International Affairs at the International Head Office of UNAM, CRAI UNAM. Um, Dr. Trigo. Thank you. Good morning to everybody. A pleasure to be with you this morning. Uh, it's me. Von Heinrich, Irish Ambassador to Mexico, Dr. Mary Francis Rodriguez Bongor, Dean of the School of Philosophy and Literature, Dr. Nair Anaya Ferreira, Academic Secretary, Dr. Laura Centino Pizarra from Sao Paulo University. Good to see you, Laura, in these different environments today. Ms. Sarah Casey, Ms. Anne Enright a wonderful opportunity to celebrate today the creation of the Ivan Boland and Enright Irish Historic Church, which will certainly strengthen the collaboration between the School of Philosophy and Literature of UNAM and the Irish Embassy here in Mexico. As it is mentioned, this chair will focus on consolidating and promoting academic 
and cultural exchanges between Ireland and Mexico. Another wonderful opportunity to be together with our wonderful Irish partners. I want to congratulate the initiative of Dr. Aurora Pinheiro and uh, Mario Muguia of the area of uh, English literature of our school for this wonderful initiative, certainly working all the details of the chair in the Irish Embassy, that today we can celebrate the beginning of this wonderful chair that we hope it will bring a lot of academic change of academics, students, Irish uh, and either undergraduate and postgraduate students to strengthen more our collaboration. And uh, also congratulations for this wonderful event entitled Joyce in America Latina Congreso Internacional 2021 that brings all the wonderful uh, analysis and rejoice again of all the creation of uh, the wonderful literature by Jane Joyce. So today is a wonderful opportunity uh, for our school, for the Irish Embassy, to celebrate the English literature in our institutions and the most, most warmest Congratulations to all of you for setting up together this wonderful program and also for the creation of the Ivan Boland and Enright Irish Stories Chair. My best celebrations for a wonderful growth of this chair. Thank you, everybody, and thanks for the invitation. Bye. Thank you, Dr. Trigu. It's a pleasure to have you here. Um, I now have the honor of presenting Dr. Mari Francis Rodriguez Van Gort, Dean of the School of Philosophy and Literature at UNAM. Thank you, Mari. Uh, good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, distinguished uh, distinguished uh, Mrs. Evan Bon, uh, Hainist, Irish Ambassador to Mexico. Dr. Jose Francisco Trigo Tavera, Vice Provost for International Affairs, International Head Office, Great UNAM. Um, distinguished participants, um, this is an honor to participate in this ceremony. The Ivan Bolan and Wright Aires Studies Chair at UNAM. I am very pleased to be starting in these conferences about Joyce and, Amer and Latin America. Um, there, there are important historical relationships between Mexico and Ireland. Therefore, this extraordinary chair is one more effort to stranger these relationships. And we hope very soon to be able to care out uh, the official installation of the extraordinary chair. This is a pleasure that the name of the chair is in honor uh, of two great rights to have, to have worked on issues about women, making a historical reflection on the role of women and in different uh, topic of areas of histor history in the world. Uh, well, welcome and congratulations. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Rodriguez Van Gort. Um, and now let me introduce uh, Dr. Nair Anaya Ferreira, Academic Secretary of the School of Philosophy and Literature, UNA. Hello, good morning. I am really very, very pleased to be here uh, with double, triple uh, celebration for me. Uh, first, I want to thank the distinguished ambassador to Ireland, uh, Ms. Mebe von Heinitz. Thank very much, Dr. Francisco Trigo to be, for being here with us. 
uh, you know how important it is to have these links all around the world and to establish this special link between Irish studies and Mexican studies and Latin American studies offer us an opportunity to establish a different set of networks, no? So that's very important. And thank you very much for supporting us today. Also, Dr. Laura Isarra, thank you very much, as well as Ms. Sarah Casey and Ms. Anne Enright. I'm really very privileged to be here. I was saying that it's a double privilege because first of all, we have the event, no? Uh, Joyce in Latin America, which has been a wonderful opportunity for sharing uh, experiences between academics of different parts. And then for the announcement of the um, Ivan Boland and Enright Irish Studies Chair. Uh, I come also from the Department of Modern Languages from English Literature. So I'm really happy about this event. Um, I think we really have to encourage the participation of women as we have been doing. And so the fact that this chair is being named by these two, uh, uh, with the name of these two phenomenal writers who are very much read among our students will help once again, as I have been saying, to strengthen the links that we have had. We have to remember that Ireland and Mexico have had sort of parallel histories, that the presence of Ireland in Mexican history is very, very, very important, no? Uh, and so to have this uh, active, up-to-date uh, opportunity to work together is something to be grateful for. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Anaya, uh, for being here and, and for your kind words. Um, and now for a very special guest. Um, she is Dr. Laura Isarra, head of the W.B. Yeats Irish Studies Chair at the University of Sao Paulo, Brazil. Uh, Dr. Isara, please. <laughs> hey, good morning and good afternoon, everybody. It's really a great privilege and honor uh, as coordinator of the WB Yates Chair of Irish Studies at the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil to be present at this very important ceremony today. I would like to congratulate Professor Jose Francisco Trigo Tavares, whom I already met in other important international networks. And I know that he is really a dynamic promoter of internationalization at UNAM. And also I would like to congratulate Dr. Van Gort and Dr. Anaya Ferreira from the School of Philosophy and Literature and Her Excellency Maeve von Heinitz, the Irish ambassador in Mexico for the establishment of the Yvonne Boland and Anne Wright Chair of Irish Studies at the very well-known Universidad Nacional de México. I also congratulate Sarah Casey from the Yvonne Boland estate and writer Anne Wright for receiving this prestigious tribute in Latin America. We are really very honored to have a chair uh, uh, after your names. The Honorable Poet Ivan Boland in Memoriam and the awarded author Anne Anwright, both highly admired, as he has just been said, by readers on this side of the Atlantic, will be the UNAM Chair's inspiration to promote Irish literature and art and to build a bridge of fruitful dialogues between Ireland and Mexico. The creation of the chair also motivates all of us, scholars of Irish studies, to establish an academic north-south link between Mexico, Brazil, and Argentina to strengthen the presence of Irish literature, history, and culture in Latin America. 
I am delighted to say that we are now three chairs united with the same aims. In Brazil since 2009, in Argentina since 2015, and now in Mexico. Welcome UNAM. We will work together creating a strong academic intercontinental and transcontinental network between our universities and Irish institutions with the mediation of the Irish embassies in our countries. It is undeniable that social, historical, and intellectual intersections and parallels exist in the political configuration of our times. Collaborative academic studies create theoretical crossovers among to, uh, among to understand wider conjunctures within the global state of affairs. So these multidirectional border crossings between national systems of higher education will help to institutionalize Irish studies, fostering a circular academic globalization of knowledge. Universities, centers, and Irish studies associations from different countries are in multiple interdependence and our institutions of higher education are responsible to revert the local knowledge to the Irish world and bring the global Irish knowledge to the local for the benefit of our societies. I know that Dr. Aurora Pinheiro and Professor Mario uh, Murgia um, both uh, have a great passion of Irish, uh, for Irish literature will lead their team enthusiastically and will offer many successful activities in the newly born Ifan Bolan and Anne Wright Chair. New traces of Irish authors in regional Latin American narratives will be revealed, such as the one between Borges and Joyce, as Professor James Ramey uh, brilliantly presented in his lecture today. Irish writers, philosophers, and critics will be also interested in Latin America, um, in Irish Latin American connections, such as Anne Anwright's novel, The Pleasure of Eliza Lynch, or Colm Toybin's novel, The Story of the Night, or even contemporary Latin American writers of Irish ascendancy will continue writing about Irish immigrants on this side of the Atlantic. So I definitely believe that the newly settled chair at UNAM, together with the two in South America and the societies that we have, Silas, Abe, and Aes, um, will construct a Latin American belt of knowledge, which will interact with and contribute to world knowledge. I wish a lifelong success to Ethan Bolan and Anne Wright Chair of Irish Studies at the prestigious Universidad Nacional de México. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Isara, for your kind words. Um, we are all very excited to be able to join this international network of chairs uh, for the sake and, of course, for the promotion of, of Irish literature. Um, and now please allow me to introduce a very special guest, uh, Miss Sarah Casey, the daughter of the great Irish poet, Evan Boland. She will say a few words um, on behalf of the Evan Boland estate, and of course, on behalf of her own family. Um, Miss Casey, please. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, firstly, I want to say thank you so much uh, for inviting me to speak today. So um, I would like to thank on behalf of my family and also, of course, on behalf of my mother, who uh, we greatly wish was here today uh, to speak herself. Um, I would like to thank you for the creation of this chair and naming it jointly in my mother's name. Uh, we are so delighted and honoured that her name is being used um, and her legacy and also her um, incredible contribution to Irish literature are being recognised for the purpose of this wonderful academic endeavour. Um, I know it would mean very much to her. Um, I also know that my mum would be uh, very pleased that this honour is being shared with such a prominent and wonderful writer as, as Anne Enright. Uh, we would also like to congratulate Anne today. 
It was mentioned um, in the months following April of 2020. It was mentioned so eloquently by a young writer who was mentioned by my mother in Stanford University that she was a guardian and guide to their transformations. When we heard about this chair, it just seemed so fitting to us as a family. My mother spent 25 years of her life teaching at Stanford University in California. And as the director of creative writing program there, which she was key in developing. She loved, my mother loved university life and she had a deep dedication to fostering the potential of all writers while she was there. In addition to also focusing of course on her poetry. She was steadfast and she was brilliant in working with young writers. She encouraged their development. She helped them to forge their own unique path. She was always taking such delight in their successes and always there to provide guidance when they needed it. She had a true commitment to the next generation and was always interested to see who was coming up behind her. Many would say that her belief in their work made their life as writers possible. So it is so wonderful for us to think as a family that her legacy will now live on in this way, in this way at UNAM. I think it's important as well to mention today from a more um, personal perspective, I think my mother would also say it herself, that a number of years back, um, herself and my father had the pleasure of visiting Mexico. So while she cannot be here today, it's very nice for us to think that she actually has had that opportunity to see Mexico already. Uh, they visited, um, I think, Tampico uh, for a conference that was taking place. And I remember a phone call with her very vividly when she rang me when I was living in London to just tell me how much she had loved the country and the people. Uh, so um, I, I think it's very nice um, that she has had that opportunity. Um, in 2020, uh, a few months following April, my mother's final book, The Historians, was released. Um, it's a beautiful body of work that we treasure. So I would like to finish today by reading one of our favorite poems from the book that she wrote about her own mother. This is called The Fire Gilder. She loved silver, she loved gold, my mother. She spoke about the influence of metals, the congruence of atoms, the art classes where she learned these things. Think of it, she would say, as she told me, to gild any surface, a master craftsman had to meld gold with mercury, had to heat both so one was volatile, one was not, and do it right, had to separate them and then burn, burn, burn mercury until it fled and left behind a skin of light. The only thing she added, but what came after that, I forgot. What she spent a lifetime forgetting could be my subject. The fenced in small towns of Leinster, the coastal villages where the language of the sea was handed on, phrases bruised by storms, by shipwrecks but isn't. My subject is the part wishing plays in the way villages are made to vanish in the way I learned to separate memory from knowledge. So one was volatile, one was not. And how I started writing, burning light, building heat until all at once, I was the fire gilder, ready to lay radiance down, ready to decorate it happened with it never did when all at once I remember what it was she said. The only thing is, it is extremely dangerous. Thank you very much, everyone. Sorry, uh, I just wanted to say thank you to, to Ms. Enright. This has been really enlightening. And uh, I just want to take a minute to, uh, to thank Dr. Alberto Vital Diaz from the Teaching Center for Foreigners, or CEPI, at UNAM for being here today. Welcome, Doctor. Thank you, Mario. And uh, uh, if, if, if there are no further comments, I think we can take a six minute break and please stay in your virtual room. Do not abandon the connection and we'll see you soon. Thank you very much. Um, welcome back everyone. Uh, I am convinced that this is a, a well, um, a meeting, um, conference of highlights and, and the next round table is certainly one of those highlights uh, because it's made up of uh, a, a group of outstanding women writers whom I would like to introduce to you now. Uh, 
of course, I will have to say that um, Anne Enright hardly needs any further introductions, but um, I will give it a try once again. Um, so Anne, Anne Enright is the awarded author of seven novels, three collections of short stories and a collection of essays. She has been granted numerous awards and is a fellow of the Royal Society of Literature. In 1995, her first novel, The Wig My Father Wore, was shortlisted for the Irish Times Aer Lingus Irish Literature Prize. What Are You Like, published in 2000, received the Encore Award and was shortlisted for the Whitbread Novel Award. In 2007, Enright published fourth novel, The Gathering, which obtained the Man Booker Prize and was considered the Irish Novel of the Year. Acknowledge, acknowledgement that The Green Road also received in 2015. In February 2020, Enright published Actress, her most recent novel. She has worked as a TV producer for the RTE Network and her short stories have appeared in several magazines like The New Yorker and The Paris Review. Um, we are also thrilled to have with us uh, Mary Costello. Uh, Mary Costello is the author of the acclaimed collection of short stories, The China Factory, uh, which was shortlisted for the first book award granted by The Guardian. Uh, Costello earned an Arts Council bursary in 2011 and 2013. Her second book and first novel, Academy Street, was published in 2014 and was widely renowned. The novel was shortlisted for the Dublin International Literary Award, the Costa First Novel Prize, and the EU Prize for Literature. Academy Street received both the awards of Irish Novel of the Year and Irish Book of the Year in 2014. Her latest novel, The River Capture, was published in 2019. Her work has been adapted by BBC, by BBC Radio 4. Um, and now for a couple of domestic authors. Um, Daniela Tarazona. Daniela Tarazona is author of El Animal Sobre la Piedra. In 2012, she published her second novel titled El Beso de la Liebre, which was shortlisted as finalist for Las Americas Literary Award in 2013. In 2020, she published a biography under the title uh, Clarice Lespector, La Mirada en el Jardín, and with illustrations by Nuria Mel. Tarazona's works have been translated into English and French. In 2015, Tarazona was acknowledged as one of the 25 Latin American literary secrets at the Guadalajara International Book Fair. Carmen Bollosa, who is also here. Thank you for being here. Carmen is a poet, playwright, novelist, and essayist. She has published 18 novels, including Antes or Before, Son Vacas no, Somos Puercos or The Cows or Pigs, Llanto, Duerme, Treinta Años or Leaving Tabasco, and Texas or Texas, The Great Theft. Two of her novels were awarded Distinction Best Novel published in Mexico by Reforma Newspaper. She also received the Javier Villaurrutia Award for Best Mexican Novel, as well as many other international awards. Her work has been translated into more than eight languages. With fellow writer Salman Rushdie, Boyosa co-founded Mexico City's House for Persecuted Writers, also known as Casa Citlaltepetl. As for her academic career, Boyosa has lectured in Argentina, Ecuador, Venezuela, Colombia, France, Spain, England, Germany, and Austria, as well as several US universities such as Brown, UC Irvine, and Princeton. She was also visiting professor at New York University, San Diego State, Georgetown, and La Sorbonne. Lucy Collin. Uh, Lucy Collin is a Brazilian writer translator and educator. She earned a BA in piano performance, a degree in Portuguese and English languages, and a BA in classical percussion. She holds a master's degree in English literature, a PhD in linguistics and English literature, and two postdoctoral degrees on Irish literature. As a creative writer, she has published more than 20 books, and her works have been included in national and international anthologies. She has been granted several literary awards, such as the Premio Jabuti Poesia, excuse my Portuguese, 
in 2016. She's a retired professor from the Federal University of Paraná and currently researches on the work of Irish poet Mary O'Donnell at the W.B. Yeats Chair of Irish Studies, University of Sao Paulo. And of course, last but not least, Lina Meruane. Lina Meruane is the author of five novels, six books of essays and numerous short stories. Her work has appeared in several international magazines such as uh, Lateral, The Literary Review, uh, Schiffer aus Feuer, among others. Her first collection of short stories, Las Infantas, was published in 1998. In 2004, she published her novel Fruta Podrida, which received the Best Novel Award granted by the National Council of Culture and Art. In 2011, she was awarded the Ana Segues Prize, and in 2012, she received the Sor Juana Inés de la Cruz Prize at the Guadalajara International Book Fair for her celebrated novel Sangre en el Ojo, or Seeing Red. In 2020, she published Avidez, her latest collection of short stories, and in 2021, the essay Zona Ciega. She currently teaches literature, Latin American cultures, and creative writing in the University of New York. Please welcome these celebrated authors. Uh, thank you, Mario, for introducing everyone and, and uh, all of you be welcomed. Um, uh, I, I, we agreed that uh, there would be a first round in which authors uh, would talk a little bit for a few minutes uh, about some of, uh, of the themes that we proposed. Uh, we sent them a list of themes and they were going to choose something from, from there and they will surprise us uh, with, with this first round of texts. And then after that, the, the, we, we will exchange some comments and questions from the audience will be, um, will be read for you to be able to answer them. So if you feel comfortable with the order in which you have been mentioned in the program, why don't we follow uh, uh, just the list and, and write Mary Costello, Daniela, Carmen, Lucy, and then Lina, so that I don't interrupt you. Just please, Anne, would you like to start? Oh, I think you need to open your microphone. We, we can't hear you. I beg your Thank pardon. you. I'm being really cheeky here. I, 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 I'm taking my courage in my hands. I'm going to. <laughs> Uh, because I'm going to read a, a tiny little bit from a novel called The Pleasure of Eliza Lynch, which, um, you know, I wrote 18 years ago um, and I haven't looked at since, but it is <laughs> it is set between Ireland and Latin America, so it, it, it accorded very nicely with your themes. Um, I, I, one of the reasons I'm terrified is because, of course, you get so much possibly wrong, although I, I researched it quite keenly at the time. There was very little written about Eliza Lynch, who was uh, in 1854 left Paris with Francisco Solano Lopez, who was the uh, dictator of Paraguay. And um, the book goes up the Paraná to Asuncion when Eliza is pregnant with her first child. The fact that they never married um, became a, a bit of a problem. People said I was saying that she, she, she was a, a bad woman. I really wasn't saying she was. She's a pregnant woman, That's, is that the same thing? I wanted to know. Anyway, so <laughs> she's an unmarried mistress of Francisco Solano Lopez. She was from County Cork in Ireland. And I was reclaiming, I thought, uh, I'm not sure if I, anyway, the little piece I took involves butterflies. And when you talk about butterflies, you, you cannot avoid Remedios the Beauty from, uh, from, from the Marquez. You cannot uh, avoid the satanic verses where there is also um, a wonderful a flock swarm of butterflies. So uh, the way you talk about butterflies is actually the way you're going to talk about reality. Um, these people are going up the Parana River, it's 1854. There's a lot of exoticism going on in a kind of Victorian colonial mindset. So that's already there, you know, it's not my fault, that's them. So I'll just read a little short piece. This morning I do not move and the boat does not move. I wait to, I wake to a clanging sound, then the abrupt hiss of coals hitting the river as they clear the boilers out. 
I lie in the oven of the state room all morning. Through the open door, I see Senor Lopez busy, frantic, intent. He unrolls plans on the table and calls for Mr. Whitehead, his engineer, so the door is closed and I must dress in the airless dark. Outside, the light hits like a brick. My dress wilts. The starch gives way in the wet air and my skirts limp altogether along the floor. So I trail around the deck and look at no one as no one looks at me. Then I lie in my gauzy tent and swing. There's a hammock in the boat. Pregnant woman in a hammock on a boat. The book. At noon, they raise sail to catch a whisper. And so we veer from one side of the vast river to the other, at which point the whisper dies. Everyone sits about. The English, all sorts of railway men, fitters, smelters, fill the boat with dull delirium. Their voices drift on the hot air and then stop. I ask Milton for the name of a tree on the bank, a handsome tree with red and peeling bark. He laughs and gleefully rubs his forearm, saying, I think, white man's skin. In the afternoon, I have my maid, Francine, put all my white veils away. They increase the power of the sun's light and the danger of sunburn and freckles. They are also, I think, very injurious to the eyes. Green is the only color that should be worn as a summer veil. Freckle wash. Take one dram of mu muriatic acid, half a pint of rainwater, half a teaspoonful of spirits of lavender, mix and apply it two or three times a day to the freckles with a camel's hair pencil. When Dr. Stewart joins us after dinner, I take him aside. He says that my complexion is probably subject to my condition, but that lemons may do the trick. He has little French and no Spanish, and so I'm forced to speak English to him. Mr. Whitehead has everything, of course, up to and including Swedish. So we assemble, my little band. It is too hot for cards. It seems that apart from my freckles, there's nothing to talk about. I try Sebastopol. I recall Buenos Aires. I wonder at the possibility of a garden in Asuncion and what might grow there. But Senor Lopez turns away turns always to the state of the unmoving boat, her inner workings, her boilers, vertical or horizontal, her trunnions, whatever they may be. I have no words for these things. And I'll leave the conversation to Mr. Whitehead. I long for my piano, but it is deep in the hold. Sometimes lurching across the Atlantic, I would hear a tinny discord, a distant twang that felt like one of my own heartstrings snapping. But we must have music. The boat is so still now and the night gathers about us as though there might never be another day. I have the captain order in a musical seaman in order to push back the darkness. The man holds his cap in his hands and gives a humble, swelling account of Barbara uh, Allen. Oh, mother, mother, make my bed to lay me down in sorrow. My love has died for me today. I'll die for him tomorrow. After which, everything is easy. Senor Lopez wants Whitehead to bet with him on our arrival date in Asuncion and he demurs. Everything he does makes us laugh now. No one can pronounce his name and this fusses him. Francine inquires by way of general mirth what his Christian na name might be and with some hesitation he brings out the pearl Keld. Dr. Stewart clears his throat to smother a laugh, I think, but then he fills our little cabin with his sudden baritone. Tuneless enough, but large, quite large. The night has gathered in again. What is that thing I wanted to say about butterflies? There was a group of them anchored to the sand of the bank, their wings flicking this way and that in the heat and the breeze. One was the most astonishing blue. I have not seen such a blue since leaving Paris. And with it, as though in colloquy, 50 more of every variety. They all sat and stirred like ladies in a garden, their skirts parting to show underskirts of a more beautiful hue, a flash of violet, a swish of peony edged with black. They spread them to sit and played with their fans and flicked open their parasols in the sun. I asked Milton why they gathered together like that on certain spots of the bank. 
he shrugged and looked, I thought, quite comical. He said that they go where an animal has pissed or a man has pissed. At least I think this is what he said. And he rolled out his tongue as though to lick. And now I do not know what I wanted to say about butterflies. I've been laughing all day, but it makes me sad. I remember the salon of the Princess Mathilde, the richest room I was ever in. And yes, women like myself, newly arrived in town, all clustered and fluttering when a rich man speaks. And when he leaves the room, a general business with fans as we settle on his words and eat. At least they do not fight, I say. Which? The butterflies. At least they are beautiful and they do not fight. Enough peace for all, he says. The silence again is deafening. The baby flutters inside me and settles. Dr. Stewart's red hair is fading to sand in the sun. He has switched from cane alcohol to a more respectable rum. So that's a little piece about butterflies, which aren't magical at all. <laughs> very far from it. Thank you very much. Thank and you. Mary, Mary Costello, please. Good afternoon, everyone. Madam Ambassador and all the speakers, it's lovely to join you all. Thank you, Aurora and Mario, for inviting me to participate. I'll say a few words about Joyce, and then I'll read a page from my novel, which pays homage to Joyce. One evening in May 1922, Joyce's eye doctor paid a visit to his Paris apartment. The doctor was astonished by the disorder. Open trunks, clothes hanging everywhere, toiletries strewn on chairs and tables and mantelpiece. Joyce was sitting on the floor with a blanket around him and facing him in the same position sat Nora. A pan with the carcass of a chicken lay on the floor between them along with a half empty bottle of wine. I often reimagined this scene, dusk falling, the room darkening, the two of them sitting there for a long time after the doctor has left, silent and sated, locked in their own separate worlds. Like all Joyce lovers, I feel a strong bond with him and long for every mention of him. He is my literary drug. I live in Galway in the west of Ireland now, but for 35 years I lived in Dublin. And like everyone who has read Ulysses, Joyce's Dublin is my Dublin. It's impossible to walk around the city without thinking of Bloom or drive past the Mullingar house in Chapel Lizard without thinking of Earwicker and Anne Olivia and their brood out the back somewhere. Like many writers, my obsessions bleed into my work. And when I was writing my last novel, The River Capture, Joyce, and especially Ulysses, leaked into the novel. One day in the middle of writing the book, I drove an hour down the road from here to Ennis and stood on the street outside the Queen's Hotel, looking up at the bedroom windows. Bloom's father, Rudolf Bloom, or Rudolf Virag, ended his life in one of those rooms. He overdosed with aconite poison he'd bought in the medical hall up the street. The Queen's Hotel is still trading. It specializes in hen parties now, or bachelorette parties. And the original facade and many of its features are still intact. I asked at the reception desk if I could go upstairs. And I climbed the stairs and walked to the landing and stood outside one of the original white paneled doors, imagining the hunting pictures on the wall, the sunlight coming through the slats of the Venetian blinds yellow streaks on Rudolph's face. The boot boy who found him gave evidence at the inquest, said Rudolph had slipped to the foot of the bed. Walking away, I had to remind myself that this was fiction. The pang for Joyce never leaves. There were days in those years writing the river capture when I was so immersed in him that I could hardly believe he was dead. Days when I was grieving him. The final months of his life were particularly sad. The flight out of France to Switzerland in, in December 1940, in the middle of the night by train, 
Joyce, Nora, Giorgio and little Stephen waiting on the platform with their belongings, like the Holy Family's flight out of Egypt, bereft of having le to leave Lucia behind. The cold days leading up to Christmas, Joyce, sick and heart sore, walking his beloved streets in Zurich, holding Stevie's hand, or standing at his favorite spot at the confluence of the two rivers. Within weeks, he was dead, all that talent gone, lost forever, and he wasn't even 59 years old. So now I'm going to read you one page from my novel, The River Capture. Luke, the main character, is a book lover and a Joyce fanatic or obsessive or Joyce lover. He loves Ulysses and Bloom and spends a lot of time mulling over them. And in this little excerpt, certain things about Ulysses perplex him or puzzle him. Why does Bloom at 38 seem so old? Old enough for Stephen to pronounce him a profound ancient male. Why is a Jewish butcher selling pork kidneys? How long can a man carry a potato in his pocket before it rots? Why is DC, the headmaster of a dopey boys school, writing a letter on foot and mouth disease in cattle? Why does Joyce say that the priest kneels when he means genuflex? Why did he write sweat pee for sweet pee and call a tap a faucet? Why does he call the Ascot Gold Cup a handicap race when even the dogs in the street know it's not? Why does it take four minutes for Bloom to climb the back stairs from his basement kitchen in Seven Eccles Street to the hall door level? How can Stephen recline against the area railings of Seven Eccles Street and simultaneously have a view into the kitchen? What possessed Joyce to situate a bunch of rowdy men in a room in the National Maternity Hospital at 10 o'clock at night, drinking beer, eating sardine sandwiches, and spouting lewd remarks, while down the corridor, Dublin women are in the throes of labor. But by far the most baffling question is how, at the end of the night, on the walk from Berriesford Place to Eccles Street, via Gardner Street, Mountjoy Square, Temple Street North, a route that Luke knows well, and estimates at 15 to 20 minutes at normal pace, and which Google Maps puts at 20 minutes. How can Bloom and Stephen, even allowing for interruptions of halt, possibly discuss, no deliberate on, at least 20 subjects of substantial conversational heft, i.e. music, literature, Ireland, Dublin, Paris, friendship, women, prostitution, diet, the influence of gaslight on the growth of paraheliotropic trees, corporation bins, the Roman Catholic Church, ecclesiastical celibacy, the Irish nation, Jesuit education, careers, the study of medicine, the past day, the influence of the pre-Sabbath, Stephen's collapse, average time per topic, one minute, and concurrent with these subjects, Bloom also privately recalled similar subjects discussed with other friends on previous nocturnal perambulations. Impossible. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Thank you very much. And now I give the floor to Daniela Tarazona. Daniela, please. Hola, muy, muy buenas tardes. Eh, me siento muy, muy agradecida por esta invitación y Muchas gracias, Aurora, por, por la invitación. Me uno a la celebración de este, de este congreso y, bueno, me siento también muy, muy honrada de, de formar parte de esta mesa con autoras tan, tan reconocidas y tan, tan destacadas. Eh, yo he preparado un texto con algunas notas alrededor del retrato del artista adolescente eh, y, eh, bueno, voy a, voy a darle lectura. Se titula Día de Sol. 1. Rememoración. La primera vez que leí el retrato del artista adolescente era joven. Había transcurrido poco tiempo desde mi propia adolescencia. Sumida en el escritorio que tenía en casa de mis padres, 
que era para mí una nave espacial, creo que leí durante una tarde casi sin parar y rodeada por aquel otoño perpetuo que ostentaba el árbol de nuestro patio, los maravillosos episodios de la vida de Stephen Dedalus. Mientras mi lectura transcurría, iba ascendiendo hacia el interior de su espíritu y el asombro salía por mis ojos bien abiertos. Recuerdo los pálpitos de mi corazón cuando me acercaba al final, la frustración al revisar las pocas páginas que faltaban para terminar la lectura de este libro extraordinario. No me quería ir de él hacia ninguna otra parte. En la nave de mi escritorio, con la cabeza inclinada, me dejaba caer como él, me deshacía y continuaba, volaba sobre el mar. Ahora que lo he leído de nuevo, encuentro las notas al margen que hice aquella vez. Leo las inscripciones. Extrasensible, apelaciones al oído, no es cierto, sonido, risas, azote, nombramiento de símbolo, la voluntad de Dios. Y encuentro el deseo que tuve en aquella época por renombrar y comprender lo que leía. Eso se supone que debe hacer un estudiante de literatura. Era de tarde ya cuando salí de la nave de mi escritorio con los ojos ardientes por no detenerme. Parte de mí hubiera querido que la lectura del libro se prolongara hasta la madrugada. Tiempo después, al formar parte de la organización de una semana de conferencias en la Universidad Iberoamericana, mis compañeros y yo pensamos que sería buena idea llevar la puesta en escena del retrato del artista adolescente cuya adaptación estaba a cargo del director y escenógrafo Martín Acosta. En algún momento, el actor que interpretaba a Stephen se desnudó y permaneció de pie frente al público en el escenario del aula magna Santa Teresa. No recuerdo si fue antes o después que él mismo soltó algunas líneas insultantes contra los jesuitas. Dos, la palabra inscrita y la ausencia. A lo largo del libro encontramos que Stephen lee inscripciones sobre mesas, en las paredes, en el anfiteatro de anatomía, en el capítulo 2, lee la palabra feto grabada, y cito, varias veces en la madera oscura y manchada. Esta palabra sobrecogió a su espíritu, le pareció sentir en torno de él a los ausentes estudiantes del colegio y espantarse de su compañía y una visión de la vida de ellos que las palabras de su padre habían sido incapaces de evocar, se elevó ante sus ojos como si brotara de las letras grabadas en la mesa. Aquellas letras grabadas en la manchada madera de pupitre le estaban contemplando fijamente, como si hicieran befa de su flaqueza corporal y de sus fútiles entusiasmos. Le provocaban a la repugnancia de su propia locura y de las asquerosas orgías de su mente. Una sola palabra puede construir el sacudimiento interior de Stephen. En ella se encuentra cifrada la conmoción de la existencia, los compañeros, su padre, la flaqueza corporal. Hay un acto de identificación. Stephen no ha nacido. Veremos más, de la, más adelante de qué modo morirá estando vivo y la manera en la que volverá a la vida después. El nacimiento del que somos parte mientras vivimos ocurre de manera inesperada. La gestación de nuestras creencias y emociones tiene lugar varias veces a lo largo del tiempo. Estamos siendo renacidos una y otra vez. Vivir, errar, caer, triunfar, volver a crear la vida con materia de vida, leemos. Mientras los dardos de luz atravesaban los cristales de mi habitación en aquella e época postadolescente, pero también cuando en esta los atraviesan, leo acerca de la magnificencia de un beso en la ausencia de la palabra beso, hendidura en sí. Cita, era demasiado, cerró los ojos y se entregó a ella en cuerpo y alma, sin conciencia de cosa de este mundo, salvo del sombrío roce, de la dulce hendidura de aquellos labios. Tres, infierno. Una cita, el infierno es una angosta, oscura y metálica mazmorra, mansión de los demonios y las almas condenadas, llena de fuego y de humo. 
la angostura de esa prisión ha sido expresamente dispuesta por Dios para castigar a aquellos que no quisieron sujetarse a sus leyes. Imagino que comparto con otras personas el extrañamiento y el horror que me produjeron las imágenes del infierno cuando las escuché siendo niña. El infierno es un lugar en donde se sufre para la eternidad. Esas palabras u otras semejantes en los labios de mis padres. La boca entonces abierta para dar lugar a figuraciones horribles. La hendidura como el beso de lo espeluznante. Stephen escucha al predicador. El predicador ilustra las formas de los cuerpos atrapados para siempre en el infinito castigo. La inocencia de Stephen aparece perdida. Luego, a través de la confesión, la vida volverá como hermosa y apacible. La narración de este progreso espiritual alumbra todos los sentidos. Desde las profundidades reprobables de los sueños que Stephen tiene de sus pecados, salen a la superficie los cuerpos desprovistos de cualidades positivas. Los cuerpos perdidos bajo el ojo que enjugan la saliva del predicador. Ahora encuentro extraño el recuerdo de mi temor ante el infierno figurado con palabras, aunque sé de cierto que he transitado por periodos infernales. La mazmorra angosta es un espacio interior que a veces puede ser la sala de estar, la sala para sobrevivir y en la que es imposible cerrar los ojos. ¿Cuál no será la hediondez del aire de, del infierno, imaginado un cadáver que hubiera estado yaciendo en su tumba, pudriéndose y descomponiéndose hasta llegar a ser una masa gelatinosa de líquida corrupción? El fuego del infierno es de otra calidad y ha sido creado por Dios para torturar y castigar al impenitente pecador. El fuego que brama para siempre es semejante a la conmoción característica de la vida interior de Stephen Dedalus. Quizá por eso... Este retrato de un artista adolescente sigue ardiendo ante los ojos de quien lo lee. 4. El artista. La plasticidad del tiempo es parte de la vida de los artistas. Más hoy, aún más ahora. En el mundo lo que ya no resta es espacio. La genialidad expresada en el retrato del artista adolescente desde luego que resiste, la vida del artista y del personaje confluyeron en la novela para extenderse a lo largo del tiempo. Podría decirse que los aspectos esenciales acerca del tiempo se encuentran dentro del libro y no fuera de él. Es la obra la que contiene las infinitas salidas de sol y sus ocasos. La ilusión de cualquier orden es parte también del espíritu del artista y de los motivos expuestos en el personaje. Ser aparte Desarrollar la destreza de la expresión con la mirada puesta en la sabiduría de los otros y cometer errores mientras tanto. En donde no hay lugar es necesario encontrar la hendidura del beso y de la palabra ausente. El artista sabe esto, por eso extiende las alas para hacerse de su propio peso en el espacio y renacer. El artista supo de nosotros y sabe que el tiempo no existe. Existe, por ejemplo, esta pregunta con su respuesta. ¿Usted cree en Jesús? Yo creo en el hombre. Dejé la nave de mi escritorio cuando era ya tarde. Con probabilidad, bajé a cenar ante el llamado de mi madre. En aquel entonces, tuve la osadía de creer que me parecía al artista adolescente que había acompañado por unas horas prolongadas hasta el día de hoy. Hacia las últimas líneas de esta novela, cuando la madre reza para que Stephen sea capaz de aprender, lo hace también con la intención de conjurar que él aprenda lo que es el corazón, y el corazón palpita, aunque sus latidos no pueden alcanzarse nunca. Porque el sentido de la vida para el artista es la búsqueda de lo que aún no se ha creado. Muchas gracias. Gracias, Daniela. Thank you very much. Uh, and, and now I give the floor to Carmen, Carmen Boullosa. Uh, please, Carmen, bienvenida. Uh, we can't hear you. I know very well. Sorry about that. Now I'm there. I'm audible. Um, hold a second. I want to, I'm going to evoke two Irish writers to be here. Um, 
or two, not two Irish writers. I got, I, I got anxious. Sorry about that. First of all, thanks very much for this invitation. Thanks, Aurora. Thanks, Mario. Thank you, Nam, and thank you all colleagues for uh, letting me join the table. And congratulations to Anne and Rich and to Boland's Poetry and Family for this chair that I'm sure is going to be um, fertile and a lot of fun for us who love literature and who love Ireland. Um, I, I'm going to bring to you just, I'm not going to read, I'm going to bring to you two images to say so. One of them is Swift's The Battle of Books, and the second one is Susan Drury, whom I brought you here, the Irish might know her, I don't know who knows her, her watercolors and who doesn't, but um, I'm going to start with the Battle of Books when I was a teenager and I decided I wanted to be a writer. I had my classics. I adored Wild. I adored Shaw. Um, I adored those that had been always at home and that I had read, if not school, like Stern. Uh, and those were the ones I knew. And as a young, very young writer, I discovered Joyce. So it was a battle of books that I was living, like in the book of Swift, between the classics and the moderns, the modernists. And that battle was uh, making noise inside of me. Of course, I discovered Guidobro that Mario mentioned, and Vallejo, and many other poets and uh, writers that were not in the classic canon of of the, the books we read at home. My father was a terrific reader, but he was also a devout Catholic. So evidently Ulysses was not at home. Yes, the artist was there and Dubliners was there, but not that kind of literature that besides he didn't like and he preferred and Ryan, he was very reactionary. So um, I started with this uh, battle inside of me when I was shaping my literary persona. And now that I was saying, well, what am I going to do? Am I going to be honest and just talk to this fight? Or am I going to take party? Because I've never taken party. I've always had this mixed, uh, uh, I'm a polygamist. I love those different kinds of writers. So I found this watercolor that Susan Drury uh, painted in 1740 that um, describes, shows uh, to the world what was left after a geological storm. We have these basalt columns that uh, are like nudes. They are new, they are the presence of a geological storm. Um, this Dubliness artist that's mainly unknown except for this work that, by the way, was reproduced by male authors that used to be was theirs, that shouldn't surprise us at all. Here we have the Giant's Causeway, if I pronounce it incorrectly, I apologize. Um, and in her views, I think, seeing them, I thought, well, the reality is that the literary texts always show or freeze these not geological storms, but these literary storms where we have the different currents or the different traditions fighting to set afloat, to show themselves. Um, so if Drury's watercolor was a magnet for the scientists because it was an unknown place and became a battleground of different theories of how Earth was created or that the basalt uh, columns were created during the 18th century and also became a magnet for, for tourists showing something that was unknown. I think that it also happens with mainly with the literary texts that show this battle ongoing, that show they do not belong 
already to a neat surface, but that are there battling to create the language and to create the form of the literary text. Um, and this battle that Swift says that happens between titles, between the classics and the modernists, and that he makes this so fun, small text or a long short story or a novella, or maybe it's only a short story, um, in reality doesn't happen in the literary personas of authors. In the literary personas of authors, we are like Drury, um, those that show that the literary text, the words, the language are way of understanding what we are through the words are always in this state of commotion or this perpetual storm. And in this perpetual storm, some authors try to shape it and leave it as it, if it sounded more traditional and others prefer to show that it's this is like the earth, something alive that is boiling and is changing all the time its shape. That is my very short contribution to our table today because I decided not to read what I had brought for you today, but to do that. And I'll end just with two verses of a poem of mine I wrote years ago when I think the battle of books was still happening in my life that said, not talking of books, but talking of my, my circumstances, lo que me rompió es lo que me dio cabida. And it is something like what broke me is what makes me be. And I think that's what happens if not to all the persons happen to me and happens also to all my books. So thank you, congratulations again for that chair. Congratulations, Aurelia, eh, Aurora and Mario. And sorry I didn't dare read, but I did, had this little idea that I couldn't uh, contain myself from telling you. And let's take, <laughs> just enjoy her, please. I love her. So different from the grabbers that are rigid and that were traveling saying she didn't exist. So here we have her, her shade and her stamp and her presence. Thank you so much. Thank you, Carmen. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. That was wonderful. Uh, and uh, well, uh, uh, and now it is uh, the time for me to give the floor to Lucy. Lucy Collin, please. Hello, good afternoon. I guess it's good morning for some and good afternoon for some other ones. So hello, everyone. First of all, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Aurora and also Professor Mario for this invitation. It's an honor to be here. It's a great pleasure indeed to be here at this meeting um, among these accomplished writers. Well, this coming together because of our relationship and love for Irish culture and Irish literature, and especially uh, in this opportunity focusing on the impact of the work of James Joyce on us. Well, my relationship to the Irish literary world, in addition to being a researcher, extends to my activity as a translator. I have already organized and translated an anthology of um, the modern Irish short story, which includes James Joyce, an anthology of uh, Eleni Huilen on poetry, an anthology of poems by Moya Cannon, and I'm currently translating the poet Mary O'Donnell. But uh, um, we previously decided here, this is what I decided uh, with uh, Professor Aurora, that I should talk about some influences, let's say, um, about uh, Irish culture, Irish literature in my own uh, uh, writings. Okay, so I will comment on two texts uh, I wrote, which are to some extent influenced by Irish literature. The first one from this a very recent publication, this is a, a collection of short stories I recently uh, released, in fact, 10 days ago. See, so it's really uh, uh, new, really fresh. Well, in this collection, um, there is a story I wrote first in my uh, uh, mind, uh, of course, while visiting St. Patrick's Cathedral. 
So I entered the cathedral and I saw something and then the story just came to my mind. Let me tell you what is that. Well, this short story is entitled, The Dean Doesn't Crawl. Uh, it's a biographical and chronological account which begins in the year 1667 in Dublin and in which there is a description of the main character from before his birth. He appears in the narrative only through epigraphs from his work and through descriptions made by other characters. His mother, the midwife who gives birth to him, his nanny, his boarding school teachers, his crazy uncle, his sister, his great and peculiar love, his political opponents, and so on. The narrative is interrupted by characters in the present moment in Brazil who, from time to time, question the veracity of the story. We follow uh, the protagonist's adventures and misadventures until his death in 1745. Uh, the story ends uh, with the pro protagonist's epitaph when, he, uh, when we, did, we readers discover uh, in the very last paragraph that we read a story about the life of, and I and I'm many uh, quite possibly already guessed uh, that it's about Jonathan Swift. So um, this in this short story, due to the impact I had while visiting the cathedral, say, uh, I'm somehow pay homage to uh, Jonathan Swift, um, this, this in fantastic author. And the second text I present is my novel. I wrote a novel that is uh, called Nossa Senhora Daqui. I'm translating it, Our Lady of Here. And we have this word here, daqui. Um, here, here stands in this case um, as the name of any imagined locality in Brazil. This book is a pocket epic, although this may sound contradictory, see? Uh, and um, this epic deals with the idea of updating the anxieties of modern men. And here I'm, I'm naturally inspired by Joyce's Ulysses, uh, but now exploring the vicissitudes of postmodern men. I was also inspired, let's say, to use this word, very much used this morning, after translating some essays by Fintan O'Toole, by the interest that the Irish have in the condition of Irishness. So in my book, I discuss the notion of uh, what we call Brasilidade, uh, what could be translated as Brazilianess, something like that. Well, this setting is somewhere in southern Brazil, a region that is characterized by ethnic diversity, as we are, we Brazilians are an amalgamation of various cultures and traditions, such as Italian, Polish, Japanese, Afro, German, Indian, Spanish, Dutch, Arabic, and others, in addition to Portuguese, of course. The entire structure of the book follows not a Greek classic, but a Latin classic, Virgil's Aeneid. And the hero, uh, the hero, inverted commas, hero of the story is not a man, but a subversive heroine, um, but not uh, the, uh, the grandiose type of the great mother or uh, of any mythological systems, but that grandmother or a great grandmother of a distance, distant or uh, of a foreign origin that practically all of us Brazilians have. In the book, this special character is called Frau Omera, very much because I myself had a grandmother uh, whose origin was uh, German. The novel has over a hundred characters named after original characters of Virgil's epic together with Brazilian names and even nicknames, very popular ones. Uh, characters whose lives are tied to this lovingly heroic figure, but unlike the classic hero whose deeds and journeys should illuminate their community and also unlike the modern hero who goes on 
a one day tour in his city, but returns home. The characters in the book are commonplace, almost anonymous, depicted in banal activities, and they practically don't move in a sort of a, um, a contemporary appro appropriation of Joyce's sense of paralysis. And they are described under the framework of the so-called liquid postmodernity. The book is divided into two mirrored parts. And in the first, the characters and their lives are described. And in the second, these stories are either completed or undone, contradicted or left unresolved. At the end, the reader finds the part, uh, finds an extra part that is called frequently asked questions. And of course, of course a reference to Ulysses itself. Um, to sum up, the tone uh, or the general atmosphere of the book, very much due to the use of irony as a critical weapon, and I'm very glad when uh, Anne mentioned and explained uh, her own use of this weapon, see, uh, irony. Uh, and my book is not a tragic uh, one, as we could expect from an epic, but it's a tragic comic one. And yes, here I am acknowledging not only Joyce, but Beckett as well. Um, there is even a diagram of all these characters. And uh, when I release this uh, book, um, I also presented that as a curiosity because of this multiple voices, let's say, together in this uh, not that long novel, let's say. Um, so that's it. Um, thank you very, very much. Thank you, Lucy. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, and, and now it is the time for me to give the floor to Lina Meruane. Lina, bienvenida, please. Hello, everybody. Thank you for this invitation, Aurora, Mario, and of course, congratulations for this uh, amazing uh, cathedra uh, that, that uh, you are inaugurating uh, today. I am very, very excited to be in this panel with Anne, Mary, Daniela, Carmen, and Lucy. Um, and so I will uh, very briefly introduce what I'm going to be reading in Spanish. I have a very sort of long uh, relationship with the question of blindness. And I wrote a novel, Seeing Red in 2012, about this uh, theme. But more recently, and due to the police violence against the Chilean uh, citizenry, in which uh, people came out to the streets to manifest their discontent, and the uh, police responded by shooting to their eyes. And so I thought, this is very um, violent and very symbolic at the same time. And I thought about uh, visual violence. And thus I wrote a essay book that deals, that has three essays. One has to do with the ways in which um, new so-called democracies maim their citizenry and particularly shoot to the eye, but also two other essays that deal with the literature of blindness, meaning uh, how blind people appear in books and also the blind writers. And a third essay on the invisibility of women, of, of blind women in literature. So what I'm going to be reading is actually a very short section, two or three sections of where I talk about Borges, uh, our blind or our emblematic blind writer, and also um, James Joyce, right? And how they were contemporaries and other things. And Aurora invited me precisely because she wanted me to read this part. So I didn't have much of a choice and this is what I'm going to do. <laughs> so uh, let me just find my, my pages here. And uh, I think there is a sort of some sort of um, uh, translation for those who maybe do not um, understand or read Spanish. So here I go. El ilegible Joyce. James Joyce, que sufría brotes intermitentes de ceguera, que recibió diversos diagnósticos y tratamientos, 
sorry. Let me just make sure that this is the beginning. Yes, okay. I'm going to start again, sorry. El ilegible Joyce. James Joyce, que sufría brotes intermitentes de ceguera, que recibió diversos diagnósticos y tratamientos que no lograron detener su deterioro ocular, no solo había leído y loado a los ciegos clásicos, sino que los había incorporado en su propia obra. En el Ulises citaba explícitamente la Odisea e implícitamente, sin entrecomillar, los versos del paraíso perdido. Borges, entusiasta de Homero y riguroso lector de Milton, lo leyó como pocos, lo escribió queriendo agotarlo, debió de reconocer en la escritura de Joyce el conocido arte de transcribir sin citar que él también practicó. Debió de percibir, Borges, el eco de los viejos versos griegos e ingleses entreverados en la prosa modernista, o al menos debió de vislumbrar las frecuentes referencias ópticas de Milton depositadas como material de construcción en la enrevesada escritura del Finnegan's Wake, y aún antes en la de Ulises. Si llegó a detectarlo, no hizo hincapié en ese hecho. Borges se había fijado en la, en la compartida afinidad por los clásicos y celebrado en Joyce sus propios méritos. La vocación enciclopédica, la precocidad de la escritura y un temprano interés por el aprendizaje de las lenguas nórdicas y la traducción. Por eso no es raro que el ciego argentino incluyera al ciego irlandés entre sus precursores, aun cuando esa ascendencia fuera inexacta. Aunque llevara muerto más de 30 años, cuando el longevo Borges memorizó la conferencia en que lo nombra, Joyce era su contemporáneo. Tan coetáneos eran que pudieron, haber cruzado, que pudieron haberse cruzado en Suiza, donde los dos pasaron, todavía en videncia, los años de la Primera Guerra Mundial, y a donde regresarían a destiempo, ya ciegos, a morir. Los huesos de ambos descansan en cementerios suizos. Al situar a Joyce en posición adelantada, Borges no solo le otorga una mayor autoridad literaria, sino que sugiere que, sino que, sugiere que escribía en un idioma mayor, con mayor prestigio se obstina en inscribir una relación con él escribiendo sobre él, alrededor de él, situándose por debajo de él. Notas, reseñas, una semblanza, un obituario elegíaco. Borges traduce fragmentos de Ulises y alude a esa obra hasta convertirse en su principal promotor en la Argentina de los años 30. Pero Borges era muchos Borges y entre ellos valoraron a Joyce de manera ambivalente. El Borges afín a las vanguardias se referiría al Ulises como intenso y delicado, y al Finnegan's como vertiginoso y lúcido, y veneraría el hallazgo poético, la feliz omnipotencia de la palabra y la musicalidad del texto joyciano. El Borges clásico, en cambio, rechazaría la exigencia que el irlandés ponía en el lector, forzándolo a descifrar más que a leer. Esos Borges suelen coincidir en una misma reseña, elogiando la letra a la vez que resintiendo el desperdicio de talento y lo que llama la gloriosa derrota de Joyce, autor de, cito, dos vastas ilegibles e eh, ilegibles novelas. Cuestiones no. El Borges minimalista se queja del excesivo Joyce y suma al listado de sus reproches al célebre segato modernista que resulta imposible conocer a los personajes de la novela. Es como si Joyce les hubiera pasado por encima un microscopio o una lupa. De poco le sirven a Borges estos objetos de la óptica que por lo demás solo permiten percibir detalles aumentados, nunca el conjunto. Negra noche novelada. Tal vez Joyce hubiera discrepado. No parecía seducido por los lentes suplementarios de la lectura, ni entusiasmado por los aparatos ópticos que auxiliaban el ver. No se interesaba por la exploración de la luz. Joyce había concebido su última novela como oscuridad, 
y la ejecutó a ciegas. Y Ulises había sido la novela de un personaje que recorre la luminosa capital de Irlanda en un día, el día más largo de la literatura, diría el hermano de Joyce. Y sacaba a la luz los tabúes sexuales y el lenguaje soez de la época. Si la había escrito todavía evidente, Finnegan's Wake, iniciada mientras su vista declinaba, sería la novela nocturna, la de la noche más negra nunca escrita. Era precisamente esa noche la que Borges rechazaba. El esfuerzo de lectura que exigía el Finnegan's parecía pensado solo para lectores visuales, dispuestos a hacer un trabajo de desciframiento. Hay que decir, en defensa de Joyce, que empezó esa novela con un ojo parchado y atenazado por dolores oculares que le procuraban un incesante lagrimeo y que fue a ojos cerrados que se introdujo en una trama que desconocía, tanteando como el, como el ciego que ya casi era el espacio laberíntico de su obra. Durante las últimas dos décadas de escritura y de vida, enfrentó la creciente opacidad de su entorno con lo que le quedaba de ojos y con los oídos atentos a un equipo de asistentes que le leía artículos y entradas enciclopédicas y lo abastecía de palabras del diccionario, etimologías, sinónimos, cognados y de todo un glosario oftalmológico que obsesionaba al autor y que debió fascinar a sí mismo al equipo que lo asistía. Su complejo procedimiento de composición colectiva se iniciaba con un Joyce atento a las líneas leídas en voz alta o recibidas en tarjetas escritas en grandes letras de molde. Eran textos anacrónicos o modernos que Joyce desglosaba mentalmente antes de dictar de vuelta oraciones que eran acertijos multilingües, o transcripciones fonéticas alejadas de la ortografía inglesa. Joyce torcía los términos, los permutaba, los pareaba unos con otros, creando neologismos y usando recursos retóricos y juegos de palabra en una combinatoria de al menos 60 lenguas vivas y muertas. Y tal vez eso fuera lo que Borges admiraba en Joyce, su empeñosa persistencia en la escritura, su fascinación por las palabras, el atrevimiento de internarse en la opacidad y de, profund y de profundizarla, de decir tan suelto de cuerpo, Joyce, si pudiera añadirle oscuridad a mi texto, por favor, déjenme saberlo. Pero pese al metódico esfuerzo de oscurecimiento, Joyce afirmó estar más interesado en el tema que en el estilo. Su novela no era sobre el lenguaje, sino sobre la noche. Era una reconstrucción de la vida nocturna, de un estado lunar, donde más que ver, se debía sentir. Era sobre la memoria agujereada del sueño también. No los sueños en sí mismos, no lo que queda después del sueño en la memoria, porque después no queda nada, decía. Y era la caótica crónica del despertar, o del resucitar, eso significa to wake, de una noche negra que no se logra ver ni con el ojo de la mente. Y con esto termino. Lucimiento. A su única hija, Joyce le entregó un nombre de luz. Lucía nació mientras a él lo trataban de la vista que empeoraba con cada cirugía. Lucía, que igualmente pudo ser Lucila o Lucina, Alina, Lina o Elena. Ella, Lucía, debía invocar por su padre la gracia de la bíblica patrona de los ciegos. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, Lina. Thank you very much, Lina. Uh, uh, and well, uh, Uh, before I open this to, to the rest of the audience, I would like you, our wonderful six writers, to start the questions. If, if any of you has a question for another writer or for your colleagues here in the panel, uh, please feel free to, to, to share this question. Carmen. I have a question for Lina, if may I? It's not going to be a proper, proper question, but it's, I think, a question that we should ask us. Um, I know that I was 
going to attend this uh, conference, I again read Borges on Joyce and saw him in the in his lecture uh, on YouTube. And all the time I was wondering, but how strange Borges that had absolutely no interest in sex. I mean, zero. There is one short story of his where we have a sexless sex encounter, a fake rape, vengeance, you know it. Uh, but he doesn't have, and well, what we see in Ulysses, unless I am, I have my, my head full of sex, uh, which might be the case, but I know that nevertheless, there is so much sex there. We have there uh, uh, the explicitly and talking about it, and not only sex, what is called of sin, and that is so on Borges. So I am um, puzzled and want to ask those who have studied, as did Lina, that's why I sent the question to her directly now. Um, how do you think Borges did with the, with the, the super sex obsession or the sex obsession that floats and is present in Joyce while in Borges, we know he, Joyce said, Borges had told him that he had, once he had done that gym, meaning lying in bed with somebody having a sex encounter, and he really couldn't understand why Bioy liked it. It was so unappealing sex. So uh, how did, um, how, how do you think Borges dealt with, uh, I, 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 Aurora, you can say, no, this question is, Carmen is out of the loop, but I think it's interesting to ask, it's so central in Joyce and so absent in Borges. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you, Carmen. I mean, I, I will start because you have named me, but if anybody else wants to chip in, please, please do. So in my reading of Borges and his reading of Joyce, as I said, I found this ambivalence, right, on, mm -hmm. on Joyce's literature endeavor. But Borges never refers uh, to sexual, I mean, he doesn't refer to his sexual life, if he had any. Or, or his sexual imaginings. Mm -hmm. And in the same manner, he does not really refer to any of the sexual stuff, not that I found in Joyce's uh, work. What I find particularly interesting about Borges is that he also elides speaking about his own uh, uh, blindness. He has a very important essay, which was published in 1980, I believe, it's on blindness. And he does speak of blindness, but he speaks of the literati who were blind. And he connects himself to an estirpe de ciegos, to a sort of a family of, of, of uh, blind people, both his um, blood family, because his father and his, his grandparents were blind. Um, and also he builds a literary relationship uh, to all these other blind writers from Homer, who we don't know if he actually existed and was blind, but uh, never mind, and Milton and, uh, and Joyce and, and others, right? And so he inscribes himself in this sort of literary a group of uh, blind ciegos venerables, como los llamaría Derrida. And he conceives of blindness as the style, the sort of the valorous style of life of men, right? And so he produces a sort of epic of blindness in his relationship with uh, Joyce, uh, Milton, and Homer, uh, and other and other uh, predecessors. Interestingly, for Argentina, um, he was the director of the uh, National uh, Library as a blind man, and his predecessor, a man called Grussac, a Frenchman, was also blind and was also the director of the National Library, which is amazing, right? So, so he builds these relationships with other blind men, and he conceives of blindness as the um, epic, right, in which male uh, writers uh, exist. But well, again, I but again you I'm sorry. but again, he does not speak about his blindness personally. He does not speak about his body ever, Borges. So he is a, a, a writer who is 
who blinds out the body, right? In a sort of in a way in which Joyce does not. Uh, because Joyce, although he's been said, he's just a very intellectual writer, a writer of words, a writer of mm -hmm. a, a poet. Actually, when you read uh, both the Ulysses and Finnegan's Wake, looking for the body, you find it everywhere. You find his syphilis, you find his surgeries, you find his eyes, you find his sex, you find his penis, you find the body everywhere, which I find really astounding and beautiful. And, and that's my answer to your question, Karen. But I think it's a very good question, answer to the yes. question, because oh. you are saying how he uh, considers the a big epic the for masculinity blindness. So in a way, he's talking about themes, maybe, at mm -hmm. the same time. Sorry. Mm -hmm. No, 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 wonderful. And I just wanted to say that Precisely in the third part of her book, Sona Siega, uh, Lina uh, deals with uh, were blind women writers and how, and, and here I'm going to use a phrase that Anne and Wright used earlier, how the reputational trick did not work for them. Uh, while in the case of Borges, he was given all this hallow of the sacred poet, blind poet, in the case of women such as uh, Vicenz or uh, Marta Brunet or Gabriela Mistral, they, they, they were not given that, that same literary prestige due to their bl physical blindness. Uh, and it has to do with that reputational trick that somehow, that does not did not happen for for them and and well that somehow is not a mysterious one we, we know what somehow we're talking about i guess uh it's just and, wonderful and, oh sorry yes. Ara, just uh, uh, to bounce off of what lena is saying there and, and and carmen the body is not just about sex it is about death very strongly if we, the the um daniela you're one the, the that wonderful uh hellscape is full of living dead people who are rotting actively <laughs> on the page. So, so for for Borges, I mean, I, I I'm no expert, but it would seem that death was was nothing. And for for Joyce, that death was this extraordinarily animated state at that at that point in the text. So, uh, I'm beginning as I get older to switch out the word sex for the word death just to start everybody thinking a bit but um or myself perhaps because that that is actually what, what the what the, the the terror of the body contains mm -hmm. uh, it's not just the fear of the body of others or of the female body but be, but uh, of your own body after death anyway i i don't know it does anyone know about borges and death uh, i have to go back and read them immediately it's great <laughs> Um, um, anyone here uh, among the panelists who would like to, to share another question? Okay, then I'm going to read only one question from the audience because we're, we're almost running out of time. Uh, uh, this is a question uh, from uh, Brian uh, Price. He says, this has been a wonderful panel, a panel, and I want to thank you all for sharing your thoughts, comments, and writing with us. As a researcher interested in liter literary history, one of the difficulties I encounter is the virtual absence of women writers who engage with joys, either critically in essays and journalism or creatively in their novels, short stories, and poetry. Obviously, this panel demonstrates that this does, does not have to be the case. Can any of you comment on why Joycean literature appears to be dominated by male writers? That this, does this absence correspond to reality or to a perception? Okay, who would like to take this one? It seems to me slightly that Joyce is seen as important and that men cluster to ideas of importance. Then they all fight about it. Um, so, so that might be, be part of how slightly spooky space Joy, Joyce academia can be. I think, you know, it, it attracts the precocious and the strange. I don't know. 
maybe that's I a think, huge insult. I think even if you took away the word Joycey and you know from that question, it's it's a catch up in general. But uh, I think it's changing. I think there's it has changed in recent years. But yes, like Anne said, um, when Brenda Maddox wrote her book on Nora, you know, it wasn't it wasn't received with the same sort of seriousness as Elman's was or. So there, there is a catch up in general that's um, a bit of balance needed. Yeah, there was an idea if you're a woman, you couldn't write about a man or, you know, you had to write about Nora. Nora didn't write the books and, every, you know, it's just, it's just mm. the fact of it, she didn't write the books. So mm -hmm. you're not really writing about the writer. You're, you're always writing about Shakespeare's sister. It used to annoy me about the past when we were asked to, you know, revive it. We were always asked to write about secondary mm -hmm or failed characters mm -hmm. <laughs> and the guys got to write about these fantastic successes, but anyway. <laughs> okay, well, I, I think it is about time that, that, that we bring this to an end, but uh, I would like to ask our panelists if anyone else would like to add a comment or, or say anything else. I wouldn't be that optimistic on the possibility of much more women writing now about Joyce, because I think there's a new um, moralistic attitude also towards literature. And it's a little bit difficult in this strength to really like Molly Bloom and the rest. There's, uh, there's going to be there, I mean, I, I, I hope more women read it and also use uh, gender studies and the point of view of a woman to really read Joyce, but it's not going to be easy. I confess that now rereading the monologue, the last wonderful, extraordinary pages, I, um, uh, though I enjoyed it so much, I felt so irritated too. Um, in, in a new sensibility of what a woman is and how do we talk about these things. Also, uh, but it's a, it's a thing uh, that, that I know will pass, but it's a new puritanism is the word I would use. A new puritanism that has taken over lots of spaces of literary studies. Uh, I, I noticed that Anne would like to say something about that. Please, Anne. No. no. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought you big, were. No. <laughs> it's really interesting. I, I have to look at Joyce again this summer for, in preparation for the February uh, uh, centenary of the uh, publication of Ulysses. And I, I, I don't know how I'll read that book now. Yeah. I would like to, you know, just chip in. I, I, somehow, I think when I was young, I didn't know what it was about, and now I'm thinking actually, there's a lot of perversion involved. There's a lot of male perversion, very specifically, involved. Uh, uh, you know, and how how am, I, how am I going to look at the Gertie McDowell um, sequence, uh, for example? You know, um, it's yes. I mean, but. Uh, I don't think we. I, I would be. I would be uh, utterly heartbroken if 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 it was lost in Puritanism. I have to say. Mm. But I think. Uh, yeah, I was just w wanted to chip in because I think that of course, the, and I and I hear Carmen when she speaks about Puritanism in literature, and sort of rereading all those books written by men and the way in which they. Uh, think about women and, 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 and gender and sex, right? And how they feel about certain things um, and how the, that, that sort of those uh, female characters are filtered by masculine uh, expectations. But I think at the same time, uh, we, we might as, as uh, female scholars and writers and fiction writers, uh, reassess, right, what that means and contextualize and produce uh, critical thinking and anti-puritanical anti thinking as well, right? So I don't think that puritanism is something that would necessarily uh, limit us, but it's sort of a, a place to think through. And, and that's why I think that I, I don't see the 
the uh, terrain closed for more women engaging with Joyce from different aspects and with Joyce uh, relationships and uh, you know in, inside and outside of the novels that that would be my, my position and, and the whole study of masculinity that is there that is maybe no other author has looked as, at masculinity with more precision yes and I, I do remember I, I was just saying yes the amount is going to happen I don't know if it's going to be a wave or if it's going to be a way of uh, a bit retiring from the that side of the yes and also I think and there's also, a slight difference between misogyny and perversion for example so and uh, 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 and puritanism and misogyny are very close in a way that Joyce was neither a puritan nor a misogynist so his active interest yes. in disgust and is is kind of part of that so yeah and, and I think also that there there's has been little conversation about uh, Joyce's syphilis and how he had become, um, uh, his sexual life had been uh, put in question, his own guilt, right, his impotence, the fact that he had, uh, you know, difficult relationships with his wife and, you know, his guilt trip with his daughter that had become, you know, um, had developed some psychiatric problems that could be related to syphilis and all of that puts also in question this idea of masculinity and virility uh, that is usually so celebrated and it, that is somehow present also in his novel. So there, I think there's a lot of thinking to do about Joyce, uh, even from his masculinity, as Carmen was suggesting. No, I, I do agree with you, but I don't know how many are going to board the trip. That no. <laughs> of course, I agree. It's super interesting, and there's a lot there to study and to read and to to see and to analyze with with a new sensibility, but uh, I I don't know. That was my only commentary. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you. Well, I, I believe many women are into Joycean studies uh, today, and let us hope for all those voices to question and challenge and say as many things as necessary. Thank you, thank you, my deep gratitude to all the panelists who joined us today, our guest writers, <laughs> and thank you everyone in the audience. Uh, um, let us remember that tomorrow we have the second day of Joyce in Latin America at 10 o'clock, 10 a.m. in the morning, Mexico City time, so you are all cordially invited to join us tomorrow. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. And see you tomorrow. Bye-bye. Thank you.